looks like we're all on. Perfect. Well, with that in mind, I'd like to call to order the Royal Oak Schools Board of Education regular board meeting of September 10th, 2020. Please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Welcome. Um, this is Van Heitzma. Can I get a roll call of the board members, please? Certainly, Mr. Brinker. Mrs. Anderson? I am here. Mr. Brinker? I am here. Mr. Briggs? Yes. Mrs. Beer? I am here. Mr. Cardamon? Mr. Cardamon? I know he's here. I'm here having difficulty unmuting, sorry. <laughs> Mrs. Sykes? Here. And Mrs. Van Heitsma is here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Fitzpatrick, could you introduce your team of administrators that are here, just so everybody's on the same page? I sure will. Uh, tonight with us, Executive Director Sarah Olson for Curriculum and Instruction, Executive Director Mr. Pat Wilinski from HR and Student Services, and from Finance and Operations, Executive Director Ms. Kathy Abella. We also have a few other guests and administrators on the call tonight that will be introduced as we do some of the presentations this evening. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move right into presentations. And that starts with the audit presentation 3.1. Mr. Dave Youngstrom from Yo and Yo. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me tonight. Can you everybody hear me okay? All right. I'll assume that's yes, you can hear me okay. I, I guess first off, I wanna I wanna thank uh, Thank you on behalf of Yo and Yo. We are certainly appreciating the opportunity to be here. Obviously, it's a very unique year for us and a lot of things, but I want to thank Kathy and her team. Uh, we really had a challenging year. They went early. Uh, we were we didn't do get to do really preliminary before all this started. So we kind of got a lot of did it all remote at first. And then we came on site and it was one of the first weeks you guys were back in the office working with us. So um, to their credit, they worked hard to get everything ready and working well in the remote environment. And here we are in September, early September with this audit presentation again. So right on schedule without missing a beat, really. Um, a lot of challenges, of course, a lot of hard work makes that happen. So I definitely want to thank them because again, it was a challenging year, not only for you as you guys open up school, I know you're going through a lot, uh, but again, for your administration, administrative team as well, it's uh, it's been a challenge too. So thank you for that effort. Um, and again, this is a different format. So if there's questions, I, I do talk fast. I'll try to slow down tonight and cover a few more things than I normally would do in the normal meeting, as well as the PowerPoint. But just uh, stop me as you go, and I'd be glad to answer any of those. Uh, and if not, we can kind of get started with that. And I'll start on the next page. Um, the general fund balance sheet this is our balance sheet, our general fund. And we have three major funds this year, the general fund, the 2018 bond, and now the new 2020 bond that we did just issue. Um, under the general fund, you'll see the, the large number of cash, about 15.2 million. That's about the same as it was last year, a similar position. Um, the due from other governmental units um, is up about 500,000, but about 6.1 million of that, mostly state aid. And you can see down below in the liability section, that's mostly accrued for those accrued salaries payable, about 6.6 .6 million. Those are the summer accruals for most of the 10 and a half week employees and the related fringe benefits that go with those. So overall, that's kind of a, a mix there. Under other assets, if you look back if, compared to prior years, you're actually up about $500,000 there this year in, the, in other assets and mostly in prepaids. You did purchase some materials for math and science that were for multiple years. So over those multiple years, we put those into prepaids and we're gonna use them as we go. Uh, expensing only the ones we need. So that number was up a little bit this year. We got some deals on some curriculum things that we were up for multiple periods. Um, under general fund, also the under and revenues. Uh, that is really related to future grants that we'll get through state aid uh, at risk, some of those dollars. And we have some taxes there, as well as food service costs that go into the, some of those and those unearned revenues when you look at that stuff. Stepping down into our fund balance, uh, you see prepaid expenditures and inventory is really non-spendable, and that is really those curriculum materials we talked about above. 
Uh, we can't spend them on anything else. We've already spent those money, so the monies will be expended in future periods. Also in the general fund under fund balance, you see an assigned amount for various operating purposes. Um, about 5.1 of that 6.7 is for the fiscal 21 budget. So that's how much we've had to set aside for that next year's budget. Um, about 400,000 of vacation and uh, termination pay. And then about 1.1 million in there is encumbrances, which are things that we've uh, obligated to spend out of prior periods that we're going to spend and receive over the summer. So we've got about 1.1 million in there. So that money is set there, set aside for those specific purposes. And then we have an RN assigned fund balance of about 7.4. If we look at the 2018 bond, um, again, it's been going for a couple of years now, and obviously the spend down on that is quite a bit, and I'll see that more on the next page. In the 2020 bond, you see we have about almost $28.7 million there, a little bit of accounts payable, about 1.7, and we're sitting on just about $27 million of fund balance in there, which again is the new bond, so just happened right before the end of the year. Our non-major governmental funds include all of our funds, food service, other capital projects funds, sinking fund, things like that. Um, mostly sitting in cash with those dollars, a little bit of accounts payable in there. Our non-spendable portion was pretty consistent from prior years, which is the food service inventory. We do have some uh, restricted food for food service, about 494,000 there. And we did spend that down by about 60,000. We had plans to spend it more working with the Department of Ed because um, we are a little bit over that limit. Our restriction for debt service is about 1.3 million. And you see our capital projects there, uh, 5.6 million, that is all a mostly sinking fund in those dollars. Our remaining money is about 7.9, just under $8 million. Uh, we have capital projects fund about 4.7, another 750,000 uh, 750, in instructional technology, um, 1.8 million in, cap, in com community service. And then one thing I do want to point out, we did this year adopt GASB 84. Um, and you probably remember talking about that at the board meeting and having a new budget for that. And that fund added about 650,000 uh, to that fund balance that used to be accounted for in the student activity funds as a fiduciary. And now it's a governmental fund. So we'll kind of look at the next page and I can kind of point that out a little bit more clearly, I think. Okay, so on our general fund there, you can see we had about $66 million in revenue and almost $66 million in expense, so about a, just a two, just under 200,000 of their change in fund balance. Um, we, it was actually, you see the asterisk there, I don't know if there's an asterisk on yours or not, but um, so that's, the, they've added fund balance to about $14.7 million. The 2018 bond fund, I uh, see 135,000 basically interest income there and about $12.9 million of expenditures. So we spent down about 12.7. So we're down about 800,000 of fund balance as of June 30th, which that money has probably all been spent by the end of the year. And we'll look at that next year for the bond audit to do something with that. And then you see in the 2020 bond, $33 million coming into revenues, uh, 6.1 in expenditures, and a change in fund balance of about 26.9 down. In our non-major funds, we had about 16.2, uh, including food service revenue being up quite a bit, as well as expenditures, about 15.2. You see, we added to those fund balances just under a million dollars, and almost all of that was in sinking fund, actually. The sinking fund increased a lot more, and we did still spend $1.5 million out of sinking fund, so all that um, happened, and we still added a little bit to fund balance, but that's almost all in the sinking fund, which will be used for capital projects in the future. Um, the 14.656578, the, the prior period adjustment balance there, if you can see that, that's the fourth column over, the second number from the bottom. That number was increased by about $608,000 due to that GASB 84, uh, where we put in, move those dollars over from the fiduciary to the governmental fund. So if you look back at last year's audit, it'll be off by the six, 608000 but this number was increased by that amount. And I know it's kind of hard to point out and with, with this document, but I just want to make sure you're aware of that number going up if you do go back and look. Okay. Hey, Dave. Yes, sir. Could you explain what GASB is to our attendees just so they understand it? Um, so we're just not using the letters? Acronyms. Yes. Absolutely. So the Governmental Accounting Standards Board issues financial reporting standards for governments to follow. Um, and they issued several of them every year, it seems like, and, and many of them don't apply to us because of things we have or don't have. Um, and GASB 84 is really specifically related to 
uh, the fiduciary reporting and how we account for that. So all of the student activity funds at the high school and things like that, what we do programs through, we collect money from students or parents for events, uh, all run through that and they were running through a fiduciary fund in the past. And 84 requires us to put it on the governmental funds balance sheet. And you adopted a budget last year to, to, to cover those gross revenues and gross expenses this year. And that's what went into that fund. Does that, is that clear enough? It does, thank you so much. Okay, perfect. All right, the next slide, we'll jump back to kind of the, rev the revenue slide here uh, as it relates to uh, the general fund revenues. Uh, the, the good news is our revenues are up about $4.5 million or about 7.2%. Um, overall, our, our percentage in allocation was pretty consistent with that. You know, federal dollars were about 170,000 up, our local money, which is mostly property taxes, up 1.6, and our state sources, which is state aid and some state grants, was up about 2.2. Interdistrict source, uh, interdistrict so in other sources was up about 500,000, and of that 5.1 million, Public Act 18, which is special ed money coming in from the county, is about 4.8 of that. So that's what mostly that is. Okay. Jumping to the expenditure side, expenses are up about 4.2 million, about just under 7 percent as well, because uh, you see we had basically a break-even year both the last two years. Um, the largest piece of this uh, salary and fringe benefits is up about 1%. So that's the 79%, up about $4 million. We're paying out more than we did a year ago, uh, 52 million there. Our purchase services is up about 1% as well, uh, 7% there. So we're spending about 80%, 6% in our people, if you will. Taking a look at the others, capital outlay, about 300,000 different supplies. We spent a little bit less this year by about 300,000. Um, our other was up about 300, and that's mostly made up of transfers, and our intergovernmental was pretty consistent from the prior year at about 2%. percent trying to advance the slide for myself, but I can't do that. <laughs> I always do like to take a look at it for uh, for purpose, uh, for people basis to what you are spending, and you can see 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 are all very close. Done a really nice job of managing that. Um, obviously, we talked about that big uh, reserve for our budget. Um, and again, look at the costs, the, the, the significant costs we have, getting prepared to open the buildings, all the safety protocols we had to follow and get that ready and in place for when our students do come back. A very challenging off season, then that's just the dollar amount that's going into that. That's not even the time that went into, has gone into that, but that's something we're gonna probably talk about a lot in the, the next year and beyond uh, as we kind of move through some of these challenging times. Looking at our general fund balance sheet, You take a look at some of these uh, slides and you can see that uh you know even though our fund balance grew in total you can see that it went up a little bit uh we used to, we had 86 days of fund balance if you will uh, two years ago 87 last year this year even though our fund balance ticked up just a little bit we only have 81 days of operation so it actually declined a little bit because our revenue expenses went up quite a bit um in our uh in our uh unassigned we have about 41 days there in our assigned, we have about 37 days there, and you can see down at the very bottom, there's about a small 3%, three days there, making about 81, uh, 81 days. And yet, you can see also it's, the, the amount has been very consistent over the last you know, six or seven years. We've done a really nice job of managing that budget and holding, uh, holding the costs in line with our revenue challenges we've had, but overall, we've done a really nice job in this area. To that end, one of, the, one of the things you guys have in your district that a lot of districts don't have is you've had pretty stable enrollment, even trending up a little bit, which is kind of unheard of in, in, the, in this day and age. And it's kind of nice to see that uh, tick down just below 5,000 in 2016, and then we're trending up again in, in 2020. And again, we'll see uh, what it means down the road for 2021 when we start to do, start doing some of those counts and some of those things. So. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. I've had a lot of districts that are in person that have had a lot of drops in that area and just the challenges that kind of go with those things. But so far, it's really good this year. Done a really nice job over the last several years in this area. So moving to talk about a few of our, our bond issues that we have out there. Oh, uh, do we not have the bond slides in here? Kathy, I don't think we do. Let me just talk about that real quickly here. So our 2018 bond, I think I talked about that in the financial statement a little bit. 
Um, the overall revenue to date is about twenty-seven point eight million, and on the, on the eighteen bond, and we've spent about just twenty-seven million of that do those dollars. So those dollar amounts were very similar, um, and so we're just about completed with that bond. The new bond, twenty twenty, we we got thirty-three million dollars in for that, and we had just over six point one spent. So we've got a, quite a bit to do there, and obviously we did a lot of work over the summer on these things. So as we kind of move through those things, we'll. We'll make sure that we, uh, or, you know, again, we're testing that. And I'll talk about that on this slide here too. So internal controls and some of the governance letter things we want to talk about here, uh, required communications, things like that. Um, you know, you guys have very good controls in place. Uh, we actually did look at the, the controls in place pre, pre COVID, post COVID, and there weren't a lot of changes. You, you guys are very electronic already. You're doing a lot of the things you were already doing proactively that allowed for a lot of those things to happen. But we did look at two different sets of controls to make sure everything was the case. It was not, you know, as we kind of looked at and understood the, the systems, we wanted to make sure we could report that we looked at both pre and post and really had no issues to report. So we're looking at our internal controls, uh, no material weaknesses and controls, no significant deficiencies. And this year we have no management comments either and same as last year. Some of the areas we did test this year, we, we did look at uh, the sinking fund testing. We did some specifics that we test the bond every year to make sure we're in compliance with what the bond and the voters uh, approved for us to spend those dollars out. We did that. We looked at competitive bidding as we followed through things. We looked at pupil membership. Uh, look at those things. You know, I talked about those posts in pre COVID. We looked at the COVID procedures you had in place. Actually, when when school shut down, we got learning plans. We looked at those to make sure they were in compliance with the state. Uh, we looked at child care. Food service we took a look at. We looked at sick and vacation time. Um, we looked at the, the pension controls and the payments that move out of that. There are several buckets within that retirement plan that we talk about. Um, we tested the retirement data. And then we also look at journal entries. So those are just some of the areas that we touched on in these internal controls. And again, we spent a lot of time doing that and uh, the staff put a lot of time getting that information together for us. And I'm glad to report that we don't have any issues to report. We're doing a really nice job in this area. Moving into our single audit, um, we did had um, about 2.6 million total in federal dollars in the current year. That's up about 300,000 uh, 300, from the prior year, about 2.3 the year the year before, mostly in food service. Uh, we are what we call the low risk oddity because we haven't had any findings in, the, in many years in this area. So we are low risk, which means we have to we can actually look at a few things. The major program we did test was special education. We typically test that every year we can. Um, it's about 1.4 million dollars of that 2.6, so it's a pretty big chunk of what you do. So to get our adequate coverage there, that easily makes that. And it's uh, and uh, there are no compliance findings related to the special ed program. Our program has 84 steps in that, and compliance is not easy because it's either right or wrong. There's no there's no in between really in that. And I think not only the finance department, the, the grant administration have done a really nice job in this area and all the areas we've looked at. So we, we give them a kudos for that because it, it's not getting any easier to test federal programs, I'll tell you that. And it's not even easier to comply with that stuff. And, and, the, and the last slide I'll leave you with is our future challenges slide. Um, taking a look at the state economic and political condition, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the challenges we faced throughout the spring and the summer. Um, you know. We, we were told not to be worried about things and continue to do what we do. And then we received a cut in August of, of revenue in our budget. And to your credit, the general fund came out really, really close and that was wonderful. So who knows what the future is gonna bring with this stuff. I know they've got some, a preliminary budget in place for next year. So we've got some good ideas there and we kind of know where we stand. So that's nice. But the COVID-19 pandemic and virtual learning are all new challenges we're facing. The costs that go with that um, are, are pretty expensive obviously. and you guys have incurred a lot of that, and that again doesn't even cost count the time. Our fringe benefit costs are continue to go up. Um, our retirement rates are large, and somebody's approaching forty percent of total salaries per salaries basis. Special ed costs, special education costs are also running high, and then our unfunded pension liability, which again there's not a whole lot we can do about that. It's one hundred and twelve million this year, um, up about twelve million from a year ago. And then we have the post-employment health, which is about 24 million. And that's down about 2.8, which is kind of nice. Um, but they're putting money in from the state of Michigan for us and we're sending it back to cover to reduce this obligation. So 
those are those last two are out of our control, but they're really big numbers when you look at your financial statements. And I'd be remiss if we didn't at least talk about that and how it impacts us when you have 40 cents of every dollar of salary is going to cover those costs. So with that, I give I finish up my uh, unusual presentation, uh, but remote presentation, if you will. Are there any questions I can answer for the board or anybody? Mrs. Van Heisman. Um, just for clarification for the viewers, too, we referenced two different bonds. If we could just clarify for the viewers, it's the one bond that we voted and passed. It's just the way that we went to market for that, if we could clarify. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have said that. It, it, the bond was passed and it was passed in different and they were sold in different series. So as we need to draw on the bonds, we sell those. And when those those expenditures come down, we moved into the next phase of the bonds and that's what it is. So it's an, an additional series within the same voted millage. That's a great question. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Youngstrom? I see none. I appreciate the unmodified opinion. That's always good to yep. hear. Yep, um, for sure. Ms. Abella, I appreciate all your efforts and the, all administration's efforts because it's good to hear that there is an unmodified opinion. So that just tells us all the work that you do on a day in, day out basis is being successful. So thank you and your team for getting us to that point. Thank you. I'll pass that along. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to the next item, 3.2 MHSAA updates. Mr. Wachowski. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Brinker. As uh, you mentioned, my name is Don Wachowski. I'm the athletic director and assistant principal here at Royal Oak High School. Coming to you live from my office, uh, my second home. It's nice to uh, it's nice to be back in the buildings over the course of the next uh, last few weeks. So, as you're probably aware, there's been a lot of moving parts in regards to athletics uh, over the past six months, really. And uh, I thought uh, we thought it'd be a great idea to join you this evening and just kind of bring you up to speed on some of the changes, some of the updates. Um, kind of the world that we've lived in the past four to six months. So we'll go ahead and do that starting now. Uh, so this update is as of September 20. Some of the major themes that uh, we've created here within our office and within our coaches, and some of these I mentioned to you in an earlier presentation, but uh, they, they need to be repeated again just because of their significance. You know, our coaches are, have been superheroes. Um, we're asking them to do things that they have never done in the past. Uh, it's much like our teaching staff. Uh, you know, they are they are monitoring, making health and safety decisions for kids that they haven't had to do in the past. They're doing screening surveys. They're disinfecting as needed. They are uh, just have been incredible leaders throughout this whole process. And most importantly, they've been providing opportunity, um, opportunity for kids to to be connected to one another. Uh, it, it's really about where opportunity and safety meet. We know that there's uh, challenges and there's hurdles, uh, but at the same time, if we're going to have opportunity, safety has to be our number one priority. Uh, competition equals cooperation. That's one thing we've adopted over the past week here to be a priority, uh, because in order for this to work, it's going to take the cooperation of a lot of folks. And you'll see uh, as we move through this presentation what that entails. Uh, flexibility, creative, creativity, and versatility. You know, that's that's what we have to do. That's kind of what we always do in this world. Uh, but it's more than ever, it's highlighted. Uh, the idea of being able to adapt, being able to adjust, and making sure that we're doing those things to keep our kids and our coaches safe. Uh, become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, you know, a lot of this, uh, just like at our, at our homes, with our families, and uh, going to the grocery store, whatever, you name it. Uh, it's uncomfortable for a lot of us right now. And, and uh, the reality is that we just have to become comfortable with that. Uh, and ultimately, we're in this together. Go ahead, Paul. So I thought I'd give you a brief timeline. How did we get here? Uh, and it's easiest if we think about this in the three uh, the three categories of sport that we're talking about here this fall. So we have our low risk fall sports and that's cross country, golf, tennis, swim and dive. We have our moderate risk fall sports, which is boys soccer and volleyball. 
And then we have a high-risk fall sport category, and for the fall, that includes football. Uh, and those uh, categories are determined by the MHSAA, and you're going to see that acronym quite a bit throughout the presentation tonight. And for those who may be unaware, the MHSAA stands for the Michigan High School Athletic Association, and they are the guidance that oversees uh, interscholastic high school and middle school athletics, school athletics in the state of Michigan. So back on March 12th, spring sports were canceled. This was a heartbreaking time for our spring sport athletes. Uh, March 12th uh, was right towards the end of our tryout week. And so we amped up, kids got excited, they got prepared, and unfortunately they were canceled uh, due to the COVID situation that we were in. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was a tough time for our kids, but we, we managed it and our kids were resilient, so were our coaches. Um, Throughout that time, up until June 22nd, there was no activity. As of June 22nd, we received summer clearance. And at that time, that clearance, in summary, was for outdoor activity only could occur. And we would follow modified step two of the reopening of school sports plan. And Paul, if you could just click on that link, we could show that briefly. At the time, this was communicated with our coaches and with our athletes and our parents. And I'm not going to go through this. It's a, it's a pretty extensive document. Uh, I'm not going to go through every point. But what I'd like you to do, Paul, if you don't mind, is just kind of scroll down right there where you'll see the modified step two reminders. These are the areas that we had to make sure we were keeping focus on. Number one, facility cleaning. Uh, number two, uh, entrance and exit strategies. Number three, we had limits on our gatherings. Number four, pre-workout screenings. Number five, uh, a very popular topic of conversation the past 48 hours is face coverings. And included in all these underneath, you'll see their standards and procedures um, and roles and responsibility of our coaches, our student athletes, and our maintenance and custodial. And then we had hygiene practices and then, of course, uh, you know, facility access, what would be available to us, what we could use, how we could use it. Um, and then the physical activity and equipment. So that those were the areas that uh, we were focusing our attention on as we develop this safe return to sport participation. So that was June 22nd and up until July 17th, uh, that was the area we lived in. So our coaches were working with kids, um, with our student athletes, and they were making sure that we were living up to every one of those uh, expectations that were mentioned earlier. But on July 17th, there was a return to play plan for fall sports. It was released by the MHSAA. And that was a progression. And the way they communicated it to us was that fall sports were going to be in the fall. At one point, they were talking about moving the entire season, the fall season to the spring. But they came out with this progression where fall sports would be in the fall. They would delay the start of competitions if necessary. Uh, they would play those low risk sports and postpone higher risk sports as needed. And then for any fall sport that was postponed, they would play that as part of the spring one season. Paul, you can go ahead and thank you. Oh, I think you might've went two slides there. There we go. Then July 29th, there was a phased in approach to fall athletics that was released. Uh, and at that time, they had said that low risk sports could begin practice in competition August 12th. Uh, once again, our low risk sports, that's our cross country, our golf and our tennis. Uh, and that moderate sports could begin practice, but no competition. And that would be 
uh, soccer, and that our high risk sports were delayed until August 17th. And that high risk sport, once again, is football. So that was our guidance when it came to tryout time, which was August 12th and 14th. So at that time, all of our fall sports did begin. And then on August 14th, uh, you know, we were throwing a curveball, and that was that football was going to be postponed to the spring. And that swim and volleyball uh, were still going to force to practice outdoors. And uh, it's worth mentioning at this time that Red Run uh, Country Club has been gracious to us, and they allowed us to use their pool. So our swim team was still able to practice outdoor, and our Royal Oak uh, Parks and Rec Department allowed us to use their sand volleyball court. So that is how we continued with uh, outdoor activity for swim and volleyball. And at that time, soccer was approved to continue practicing, but they could not play games. And at, as of September 3rd, there was a release in Executive Order 176 from the governor's office that lifted all the restrictions on sport, uh, which then uh, put football back into the picture and it put all other sports back in. And that included soccer competition, which could begin immediately. September 8th and 9th, football was reinstated. Swim and dive and volleyball was reinstated at that time to begin indoors. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. And then on September 9th, there was a release uh, executive order 180, which clarified face coverings for all sports were required uh, except for swim and dive. Uh, and recently, uh, that language has caused a lot of controversy, a lot of questions around safety of student athletes uh, in regards to, you know, is it safe for, say, a cross country runner to be wearing a mask throughout their entire competition? And so there were a lot of questions being asked, uh, and the MHSAA was able to seek clarification that just came out a couple hours ago. And ultimately, in regards to face coverings, we now have uh, the following guidelines, cross-country golf and tennis. They are not required during active participation to wear face coverings. Football, soccer, and volleyball, it still is required at all times. Uh, there are no provisions in EO 180 for medical waivers. That is something that uh, has come up and it's a question that we've been asked. But as of right now, there are no provisions in place for medical waivers. Uh, facial coverings are still required for coaches, spectators, game event staff, et cetera. And as in the past, uh, even with our student athletes, no matter what category they're in, our coaches, everybody they are required to and from vehicles when they're entering and exiting, um, when they're beginning practices, uh, et cetera. So uh, a lot of times we'll see our kids are wearing them in warm ups if they're doing stretches and those sorts of things. So that sort of provides us a timeline of where we've been. There were a lot of kind of roller coasters of information that was coming in. Uh, but ultimately, if I could simplify it in two pages or three pages, I think that was that that's where we landed. Uh, were there any questions uh, on those uh, particular executive orders or that timeline that I can be helpful with? Mrs. Anderson. A couple questions. Oh, so what is the, what's going to happen with spectators? Great question. Uh, I will uh, get to that in the uh, next oh. slide here. So, okay. I, but, so what about locker rooms? Can this, can the athletes use the locker rooms or how's that working? So as of right now, the guidance is that we, we are not using locker rooms unless we have to, and that have to, is primarily around the idea of bathroom accessibility. So we are asking visiting teams to come dressed and prepared, um, as well as we're asking our kids to do that also. So they'll be coming from home, uh, you know, dressed and ready to go. And so that's, that's where we're at at this current time. Thank you. Of course, when it comes to situations like thunder and lightning or circumstances where safety could be an issue, um, that is the times when we would open up the locker rooms fully, uh, but we would expect kids to mask up and to social distance to the greatest extent possible. This is Van Heitzma. Um, I know you're going to speak to spectators. So how how is um, 
the agency, um, MHSAA, take their guidance from the county. So is it a county, um, just, you know, I don't know as much about sports, obviously, but just if you can talk how the county health department has input into anything, um, any of these. It's a great question. So when it comes to the relationship between the MHSA and the local health departments, a lot of times they'll make a statement and the statement will say schools have the ability to, you know, make their own decisions or they recommend that they reach out to their local health departments. So we've built a great relationship with our Oakland County Health Department. Uh, we have some of some really fine uh, nurses that have uh, done great work communicating to us um, that I've gotten to know pretty well over the past four or five months in, in the questions that I've asked them. And so the Oakland County Health Department has been extremely helpful. They've released guidance. Um, but their guidance primarily is in regards to, uh, you know, a toolkit for how we handle situations such as how are we, uh, how are we setting up screening surveys? How are we handling uh, close contact cases? Or how are we handling situations where there might be a confirmed case? So when it comes to situations like that, the Oakland County Health Department has, has been our number one primary resource. Um, and so all of this has really been a culmination of work between the governor, the governor's office, uh, her, her medical personnel, her medical teams, the MHSAA, their medical teams, and then working with the local health departments as well. Paul, if you can jump to that next slide there. So, as I mentioned, the health and safety, that's the most important thing of our coaches and our athletes. Uh, you know, and the foundation really for our safe return has been four things. It's been a screening survey um, that's required uh, daily for our student athletes to fill out, um, confirming that they don't have any symptoms that come along with uh, COVID, that they also have not been in contact with any confirmed cases of COVID. And our coaches do that same thing as well. Uh, we do on-site temperature checks when our student athletes arrive. Uh, and of course, masks and facial coverings are required and then the social distancing. So if I had to summarize our approach to keeping our athletes and coaches safe, it really revolves around those four things. Uh, if you could quickly uh, click on that parent athlete checklist link, I think that will be helpful for everybody to uh, take a look at. I'll spend a few minutes on this. So this has been a document that's lived with us since we started activity in the summer, but it's basically a checklist um, that says that they've re they've reviewed our plan. Um, they've completed the mandatory COVID-19 screening within the past 24 hours of activity. Uh, you know, and we've really been focused on this idea that honesty keeps us all safe. Uh, we need people to be honest if we're going to be able to implement this appropriately. Um, they're aware that there will be on-site temperature checks and that any uh, temperature check above 100.3 will result in holding their child out of practice. Um, they understand that all indoor facilities uh, were closed until further notice. Now that has recently changed as of this past Wednesday. Um, that they'll maintain six feet of social distance at all times, that they'll ensure that the backpacks, clothing, equipment are placed six feet apart. They'll provide and wear face uh, coverings at arrival, practice, and exiting. Uh, they need to bring their own water bottle. Our hydration stations are not available. We are not, if you come to one of our events, we do not have water on the sidelines. Of course, if an athlete does not bring it, we are not going to have them go without water. We do have bottled water that we can bring uh, out to our student athletes. And at the same time, we've also uh, put water, um, we've replaced our drinking fountains with the bottle fillers out at the stadium so those can be used as well. And thank you to uh, Pat Murphy and our facilities department for helping us with that quick transition. Uh, they'll support the during activity expectations we've mentioned before, washing hands, using sanitizer, no spitting, no sharing of personal equipment, uh, no physical contact, just as handshakes, high fives, fist bumps, and or hugs. I will say that that's probably been the most challenging aspect for our kids right now. 
Uh, you can imagine how easily uh, giving the rock or high fives has been done in the past, and now they're not allowed to do that. So that has been a transition. Um, support the following post activity expectations. We're just asking to help them distance equipment when they bring it home as needed. Um, leave immediately to avoid unnecessary gatherings, uh, showering upon completion of activities, and then washing their practice clothes daily. So that's the parent student athlete checklist that's been our guidance throughout this process. Uh, each head coach was provided a coach's kit, uh, which includes a thermometer, extra face masks, gloves, face shields, hand sanitizer, and disinfectant spray and wipes. Uh, we are working closely with maintenance to ensure that appropriate cleaning is occurring. And uh, per the question that uh, was given earlier, uh, you know, any of our positive cases um, that we may run into uh, or close contact situations, we are following Oakland County Health Department guidance. And not only are we following it, but we're also reporting as needed. And uh, we're also in constant communication with them uh, with any questions or perhaps gray area type situations. We are not the ones that are making the medical decisions. Um, we are looking for the medical professionals to assist us with that. When it comes to health and safety and our spectators, this has been an ongoing question that we've been getting for a long time. Uh, this took a while to iron out uh, with not only the governor's office, but also the Michigan High School Athletic Association. Um, and ultimately we landed here, and this is where we, I would imagine we will live and continue to live this fall and possibly winter and spring if we stay in phase four. And that's each participant is allowed two guests for indoor sports and each participant is allowed two guests for outdoor sports. Our participants are defined as players, managers, coaches, officials, and cheerleaders in uniform. And uh, right here, if you click on that link, we'll spend just a few minutes on this. This was a recently created document that was shared uh, publicly within the past day or two once we had this, um, this guidance. And this is our safe spectator expectations. Uh, tickets and admission, so each participant will be designated two tickets. Royal Oak High School will pre-distribute tickets prior to the event to our coaches and athletes. Um, and we just put a reminder in your spectators, please ask your student or athlete or child for their ticket because uh, we've run into some situations where they've gone home with the student athlete and they don't get uh, in the parents or guardians or fans' hands. So we are pre-distributing tickets. We have taken every single event home and away that we have and we have enveloped uh, 40 to 100, however many participants we have tickets, each one per game. We've handed those to our coaches and our coaches will distribute those tickets prior to uh, the night before the event. Visiting schools will utilize either a pre-distribution much like us or will call. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do have to be stringent on this, that no spectator will be allowed in without a ticket. Or, or their name being on a will call list. So spectators uh, may be asked to provide a valid ID. And so if they don't have a ticket and they're not on will call, we, we are not letting them in. And those event fees, uh, we are saying that exact change is preferred. Uh, freshman JVB games are $3 and JV and varsity are five. Uh, Pre-entry uh, for pregame, facial coverings are required for entry. Um, we are staggering our, our, uh, our start times. They are the same that they've been in the past, 4.30, uh, 4 o'clock, 5.30, and 7 for like our triple headers in soccer. But what we are doing is we are not opening ticket windows until at least uh, 20 minutes prior to the first game. The exception, of course, will be football just because of the larger crowd, which will be 30 minutes prior. And then for the games two or three that might precede the first game, uh, or follow the first game, um, we are not letting the new game or the next game spectators in until we have cleared the stands for the previous game. Uh, during game expectations, of course, the facial coverings and social distancing are still required throughout the entirety of the competition and while entering and exiting the Royal Oak event. Um, we do have designated areas in our stands and our bleachers. Uh, those areas will be communicated by our announcer and game management. Um, and spectators who choose to stand along the fence lines must maintain social distancing expectations. And then our post-game expectations, uh, spectators will be expected to leave immediately upon the completion of the game. 
They can wait for their athletes in parking lot areas. Um, exit gates will be determined based on the event and be communicated by our announcer. So when I say that, it depends if we're running a football event and we're using both bleachers on the east and west side, we're going to have to have additional gates for exits. Um, when we're just using the west side bleacher, uh, we'll be sending uh, fans out on the west side gate and letting them in through the main entrance as part of our transition. And then we're asking that spectators and athletes minimize post-game gatherings. Uh, many of you have attended our Friday night football games. And just for an example, uh, it's been a bit of a transit uh, tradition for our parents to stand near the old concession stand and wait for the athletes to come off. And it's been a nice uh, opportunity for them to congratulate, hug, uh, discuss the games. And it, it had a nice real kind of family feel to it. Uh, but unfortunately, things like that, because of the gatherings, are no longer going to be able to happen. So we are, once again, clearing fans. Just going back to our, our theme of cooperation equals competition. And then uh, I'm ending a lot of our emails, and you'll see at the end, uh, together is the key here. We'll maximize the safety of our student athletes, coaches, and spectators. <clears throat> One, uh, you don't have to go back, Paula, but one uh, thing to focus on there was that uh, there uh, it will not be concessions um, for either outdoor or indoor sports until further notice, that there was just some inherited risks with that that we did not want to, um, you know, take on at this point. Schedules and updates, not sure why the, the top line there uh, isn't showing up, but uh, there was a link to our website, which is www dot g o r o athletics dot org. Um, that is where you can view our schedules as well as any update in regards to changes with our policies and our procedures. If you were to go there today, the first uh, uh, rolling um, view there on our uh, slideshow would be the spectator expectations that we've posted recently. And then moving on to our our final slide. Not quite sure. Once again, we just uh, have a few things that aren't showing. Luckily, I'm, I've got my computer open here, so I'm able to see what I had put on those slides. But just some final thoughts. There we go. Final thoughts. Uh, you know, once again, I can't say it enough. This is we're all in this together. Uh, it's going to take our, our our parents, our guardians, our administration, our maintenance, um, our coaches, our student athletes. It's really just going to take us all working together, being on the same page to ensure that we have a safe, healthy, cooperative and uh, competitive fall season. You know, those two photos right there are some of my favorites over the years. That's our cross country team that uh, went to the state finals last year. Uh, you can just see, uh, you know, their their excitement and their enthusiasm. They're excited to have the opportunity to try to get back there again this year. And then on the right, we have our uh, annual pink game that our football team does. And. Pretty incredible. I captured that on my phone, but uh, the sky is basically a pink sky as well. And uh, it's, it's a pretty cool photo that we've had over the years. So, uh, of course, I'm going to open it up to any questions that you might have. But ultimately, I just want to say that, uh, you know, I thank you for your support. I also thank you for your patience. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, if I was dealing with a lot of questions and concerns throughout this process, I'm sure everybody uh, from our administrative team to our board was as well. And as much as we wanted to be able to give definitive answers, yes and no, we know that right now uh, the reality is that we, we're not living in a yes or no world. Um, and so unfortunately we've had to work through some things, um, but I'm pretty confident at this point that um, we are not gonna have many changes. We're gonna be able to enter our fall season competitions here uh, with confidence in our plans, confidence in our people. And we're optimistic and, and hopeful that we'll be able to keep everybody safe. Mrs. Beer. 
<laughs> unmute. <laughs> um, I would just like to say thank you so much. Um, so much that came your way so quickly. Um, in every area, there's just been an amazing number of changes and things that have had to happen. And I know with the number of people you have to deal with every day um, and the number of parents you have to deal with every day, uh, that the concerns are great. So I appreciate you keeping everybody's safety and healthy and uh, you know all of that at the forefront of your thoughts and plans. And I know it doesn't begin and end with you. It just has to be led by you. So I appreciate you and I uh, just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, and, and I think we've said this to the board before, and if you recall the meeting we had this summer, it's, it's a great example of the work that Mr. Wachowski and his staff have done, uh, not only toward athletics and all these special events, but also uh, working on our subcommittee for uh, other operations around the district. Um, our, our buildings, our schools in general, will benefit from the work that athletics have done. Um, and in some cases, the trials that they've had to go through and figure out this summer um, practices, our, our camps that we held, uh, the protocols and sheets, um, you know, as you can see from tonight's presentation, it's been very thorough. Many of those practices and protocols uh, can be changed and edited to then apply to our school buildings and how they operate. So the thoroughness and the, the complexities that you see in athletics just to run a practice or run one contest that was described to you this evening um, that that would again in in mass help us determine what our school buildings will look like as our students return uh, in much greater numbers. Uh, the outdoor uh, factor for many of these practices has been to our benefit. Our students have been able to be outdoor, and outdoor is always safer and a little less risk than being indoor, as we've consistently heard from our health department. Um, and then the limiting of the spectators and. The processes, if our graduation uh, that we held uh, at the end of the school year is any indication of how these games will go, uh, that was very well planned uh, and we received a lot, of, a lot of good comments about that. Again, that then led the way for some of the other camps and things we had this summer. So, Mr. Wachowski, I, I echo uh, the board comments that um, I appreciate the thoroughness of this report and keeping our, our coaches and our student athletes um, safe as best we can and still try to have uh, some things occur at the school that were expected for this year. Um, but please know that so much of your work is going to be applied to the remaining um, functions of the district throughout the school year. And, and I'm very appreciative for that. So thank you. Thank you. Any other commentary, Mrs. Van Heitzma? Um, yes, I'd also like to thank Mr. Wachowski for the amount of work and time and effort that's put into this. Um, it's it's amazing, um, and I'm I'm glad for our athletes that they're able to do this. It's it's fabulous, and I know the kids have been dying for their physical activity and their organized physical activity. Um, just to elaborate, and I guess this may go more to Ms. Fitzpatrick too. So as we look at the athletes having the ability to gather in these areas for their activities, how is that going to expand into other um, organized activities for students? Um, in particular, you know, student clubs or, or other things. I know that's a little bit different than athletics because it's governed by a different body. But, you know, recognizing that there's students that aren't athletes that strive for that community and togetherness as well. How, how you know, how are we reconciling that? So we're gonna um, take, as I said, many of the practices that Mr. Wachowski talked about this evening and apply those to some of these other groups. I mean, our rules of thumb that we've been told by the state consistently in our return to school planning has always been outdoor over indoor, you know, less is more. So the fewer people you have gathering at any one time, so you see the restrictions in, in guests and things. Um, we also would say to that end, uh, to your question, that remote is also better if possible. So um, we wouldn't have every club meet every time, but perhaps to get the um, social aspect with social distancing, uh, maybe in the future, the, as the clubs could begin to meet, uh, we could do some of that with um, the appropriate protocols in place, much like you're seeing for the athletes, um, and then rely on other remote means uh, as things uh, progress, just to you know limit the number of contacts. Uh, the seasons have been shortened. I don't know if Mr. Wachowski mentioned that. Um, this won't be a normal size season uh, for many of the, the sports, uh, but there will be some. And so I would say we'd apply that rule of thumb to our clubs as well. They wouldn't meet maybe weekly like they typically would in person, but uh, we could work on some protocols to have some of those things exist as well. And, and actually clubs and uh, other uh, Schedule B 
uh, type activities is on our agenda for discussion tonight as well from a, a budget point of view. Can I ask Mr. Wachowski to the number of students that we have? I know um, athletics is voluntary at this point. Can you speak to how many numbers of participants roughly that we have for the, the sports? That's a tough number for me to, to come up with today. Um, but I, but I will say that we have reviewed our numbers and we're, uh, we're we feel very good about the fact that in most of our sports, if not all, our numbers have increased from past years. Um, so that's a that's a good sign that you know kids were excited and and families were confident in in a return in in the policies and the procedures that that we had in place. Um, you know, if I had to ballpark a number for you, I would probably say somewhere around probably 400 uh, student athletes that we currently have. Uh, but please don't hold me to that. <laughs> Any other questions, Mrs. Anderson? So, will the marching band be at the football games this year, this season? It's a great question. So, Mr. Jensen and I have had uh, have had conversations about that, and the Michigan High School Athletic Association has limited football games to sideline cheerleaders uh, and football players only. And that has been determined based on, uh, I imagine, the idea of limiting the amount of people that we have within our facility. And so uh, the good news is that uh, Mr. Jensen and the marching band is active right now. Um, they are practicing daily. They're following much of the same protocols that we are. Um, and they are preparing uh, as they normally do this fall. Um, as far as for their performances, I, I'm not all that familiar with with that world, but they are active. They're participating um, and we are brainstorming some ideas that uh, may allow for some performances. Uh, but as far as at the games, um, they, they will not be in attendance this year. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Sykes. Hi, I just wondered if. Um... You have any time limit changes to your games, say the soccer games or the football games like. Um, you know, I know that the periods are X amount of time long, but I didn't know if there was a, a, a time limit. Like, if there's other stuff going on, if somebody gets hurt or anything, are you to be done by like. Tennis matches this year went to like an hour and 10 minutes period. You're done. Do you have anything like that? So a lot of the we haven't had any changes as far as the the games themselves. You know, if you think about like like a major league baseball, some of their double headers have gone to seven innings instead of a typical nine inning, you know, to preserve arms and things like that. But from our perspective, a lot of the changes that you'll see are more off the field type changes. So, for example, our football sideline used to be from the 40 yard line to the 40 yard line. Now it's going to be from the 10 yard line to the 10 yard line just to allow for social distancing. And uh, I think it was the 40 to 40, but uh, don't quote me on that, but it's the 10 to 10 yard line. So um, like our benches for soccer, we've added additional space for benches so that kids can social distance. Um, you know, they are wearing masks. Um, so a lot of the stuff that uh, adjustments that have been made have been made kind of off the field to ensure that uh, that social distancing and mask wearing was was occurring. There are some other rule changes and some accommodations that I could continue to go into, but like tennis, for example, uh, you know, they're assigning tennis balls to each team. So they'll be marked in a certain way where um, within a match, the Royal Oak students know if they're able to grab those balls with their hands and be able to serve them versus if it's the other team's ball where then they will only you know lift it with the racket and hit it across the net so i mean there's a lot of these things that are in place uh, that are trying to ensure the safety of our athletes this is dan heitzma i just have one quick uh, question so in regards to some of the sports that are indoor versus the outdoor sports are the parameters different? Because I know the, the restrictions that we've been going through um, through COVID, indoor and outdoor has always been viewed differently. 
So how is the indoor sports um, parameters or, or different than the outdoor? Well, the interesting thing is that there's not that much of a significant difference. Um, the mask wearing is still required. The social distancing is still required. Of course, from our perspective, all the screening surveys and the temperature checks are still required. Um, the limitations uh, still exist as far as spectators. They're only allowed two. Um, we'll expect our, spe our spectators to be social distanced. Um, but as far as the uh, you know difference between outdoor and indoor, uh, you know they're they're pretty much the same uh, in regards to how we're going to be handling uh, those events. Thank you. Any other further questions for Mr. Wachowski? Well, I see none. Mr. Wachowski, thank you for your leadership in keeping our student athletes safe. Um, I liked your optimism when you said there would be no further changes. I, with the amount of executive orders that are out there, I, I like that optimism. So <laughs> thank you very much. I still have it. It's Good, still, I like still it. ongoing. But thank you to everybody. And once again, thank you to our coaches and our student athletes and families. So with that, we'll move on to reports. Uh, 4.1 curriculum and instruction, Mrs. Olson. Hello, good evening, I just unmuted. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see everybody virtually. We are about to complete the first week of school, which is always very exciting. It's one of my favorite times of the year. I heard many stories this week about students planning for the first day in much the same way that they always have, getting their supplies together and setting alarm clocks. This week was the week all schools put into place the learning plans that were presented to the board. I want to thank all of our staff for their work over the summer, putting together a learning plan that is in the best interest of our students in this very unique environment for schools. Um, we all know that we would much prefer to be uh, together face to face, um, but we're doing the best I can to make the best learning environment for our students as we start the new year. As I hope all students and families have experienced by now, learning is much different this fall than it was in the spring. Our goal when we began building the schedules and learning for this year was to put a focus on robust learning regularly scheduled classes, live instruction, and classroom connections. And also to bring back some school processes like grading and report cards. For example, this fall you will see us using and going back to our formative assessments and our universal screening processes. We were also able to do a few back to school activities like registration and meet and greet events in parking lots where students were able to pick up materials. Of course, these were organized in a very different way than in past years, but it was a very nice way to kick off the school year. This fall, all schools will be hosting their annual back to school and uh, curriculum nights, but of course those will be virtual. Classes have spent the first few days this week and making classroom connections, just like we do every year. The first week of school is always spent creating community and sharing expectations for each other and for the year. Every school has deliberately included social emotional lessons and activities for this week, and those will continue throughout the year. Lisa Shannon, our director of elementary education, will go into more detail in a few moments about some of those lessons that we're kicking off this week. Students are practicing and using the new learning platforms like Canvas and WebEx, um, and Ben Rader, our director of secondary education, will discuss those in a little more detail in a few minutes. As many of you know, we have a team that has been working hard packaging and distributing Chromebooks to families that indicated they are in need of a device for student remote learning. The first events for distribution took place during each school's registration and uh, meet and greet events in late August. The second event took place this week. The form to indicate a need for a device will go out again soon so that we can prepare for more events of Chromebook distribution. As many are aware, there is an extreme shortage of technology devices available, not just here uh, in Royal Oak or around the state, probably across the country. Uh, delivery times um, are extremely long at this point. I do have on the agenda for tonight, Resolution 9.4, authorizing the superintendent to finalize the purchase of Chromebooks 
with an estimated unit cost of $200, $200 each and a total expenditure not to exceed $100,000. Um, this should uh, be able to purchase 500 uh, Chromebooks. We went over the details of this purchase at last week's um, finance and facilities meeting. Finally, and most importantly, um, thank you to all of our families and students for your efforts to stay engaged, connected, and for all of your contributions, especially as we start the year. I spent a few days this week distributing Chromebooks to families here in the Churchill parking lot, which was really great because I was able to talk to a lot of parents. We had a lot of nice conversations about the way things seem different, but a lot of our conversations went to how back to school, many things felt the same. So that was really nice. I spoke with one parent who said to me, I hope I'm in the right place. I was trying to read all of my emails from the schools. So yes, there has been a lot of communication um, going out. So thank you um, to everyone for your efforts to keep up. I think going forward, we will settle into a routine and the number of emails with directions uh, and instructions should slow down a little bit. Um, we have the schedules that were put in place this week are the schedules that were approved by the board and presented to the board um, back in August. So we have live lessons going on this week. Students had their first live sessions with their teachers and met each other. Um, they're also learning how to do their asynchronous learning when they're not in front of a live class. And so that's um, all going really well right now too. I, as far as I know, in fact, one of the parents said to me in the parking lot the other night, we have not had any major technology glitches. We haven't had any shutdowns. We haven't really had any um, any of the, the uh, tools that we put in place um, not working for us. Of course, uh, all of us are working out all the details of how do I get it to work the way I want it to work and how do we um, need to use it um, to the to the, make the best use of our classroom time. So we're still working on those things, but we do have everything up and running um, and was ready for the first day of school. We have a few more, I, we have more details that are gonna be covered by Ben and Lisa in those departments and on a really nice presentation by Jane Flaherty Graham, our special ed director. Do you wanna take questions from what I went over now or should we wait till the end? Because they have many more details to share as well. Any questions for Mrs. Olson? Mrs. Van I'll just wait till the end. That way they may be addressed. <laughs> That's what I'm worried about. We have a lot more details about the technology platforms and the lessons and the WebEx and everything. Okay, thanks. Uh, you know, I'm going to turn it over to Jane Flaherty Graham, our Director of Special Education. Jane? Good evening, everyone. Um, just as Sarah said, I think there's a familiar theme here tonight, like the start of our, our school year has always been a, a hectic time for families and staff. And um, But just as this year, Sarah mentioned that there are many similarities that we experience, you know, ev every year. Um, but also we're filled with, you know, many new learning experiences and the unique challenges. Um, I have to say the, the consistent message that I've shared with our learning community, with parents um, and, and everyone that we, we walk, that we, we encounter is that, you know, the message to breathe deeply and know that every day is going to be better. I, the, this year is, is, is that that's true every year, but more so um, than ever before. Um, this week, our special education staff has been busy uh, meeting with families and students, assembling and delivering resources to our students to use at home, and finalizing schedules for in-person instruction. Um, as a result of the in-person or the ESY learning that occurred this summer, we are implementing some uh, familiar and similar procedures and plans for many of our students with IEPs. Um, we will also be virtual, of course, but we will work to um, put in those in-person um, learning opportunities. Our self-contained programs for students that have emotional impairment or cognitive delays or maybe on the autism spectrum are meeting twice a week um, for two hours for in-person sessions. I know at the high school, we have a level three program that uh, Michelle Wolf is the, the lead teacher there. And she's actually bringing her students in for four days a week 
um, for two hour sessions. So that's that's quite a bit of face to face time. Um, the appropriate PPE will be utilized and teachers and therapists are working um, usually with students and um, one to two students at a time um, with the, again, the appropriate safety precautions. Our academic support programs, such as speech therapy, OT, physical therapy, and social work will also provide in-person instruction, usually one to two times a week, but again, according to the individual needs of students. Some students may need more, some students may require less. And again, we will be utilizing the remote learning sessions um, that uh, we, we have in place. Um, we have learned we've grown a great deal from last spring, and we realized that our, our youngest learners with special needs um, struggle with that virtual instruction. Um, therefore, we're putting materials together and we have delivered materials um, that parents will be able to use at home with their students in place of the computer time, because that was the feedback that we learned in the spring. Um, parents just, you know, we, we all knew that our, our kiddos struggled that way. Um, this fall, we will also be utilizing our paraprofessionals to help support our students with the IEPs in their remote learning. Last spring, our, our paras engaged in 70 hours of professional development and, that focused on meeting the social emotional needs and developmental needs of our students with varied disabilities. So our paras have um, a good, strong um, learning base right now, and they have strong relationships with their Royal Oak families. So we want to ensure that we include their expertise in moving forward um, with our plans this year. Um, finally, I'd like to thank our awesome special ed staff. Um, they are, you know, they do a tremendous job and they've been working during the summer and uh, also now, obviously, to plan for their, their students this year. Um, on Friday, August 28th, I, I held a voluntary staff meeting, and this was a voluntary because it was prior to this required start of their, their school year. And there were 77 of the 82 staff members present. So I think that speaks volumes to their commitment. And this is just one example of the teamwork um, shared during the past month. Uh, so I, I believe optimistically um, with Don Wachkowski and, and Sarah and, and the entire team that with this level of engagement and dedication to our students that the 2020-21 school year promises to be a positive experience for all Royal Oak students. Thank you. We can go to, um, uh, let's turn it over to Lisa Shannon. Lisa, are you ready to do our next part? Yes, good evening. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm Lisa Shannon, Supervisor of Elementary Education. Um, like Sarah and Jane have just pre previously said, our teachers have worked very hard the last few weeks to make the 2021 school year a success. And um, we are definitely off um, on the right foot. Um, the first two weeks of school, you'll see a lot of focus on community building, relationship building, uh, social emotional learning. Um, it's more important than ever right now to support the well being of our students. Um, we're taking the time to talk with our students and build empathy. So you're going to see a lot of that and hear a lot of that in your homes during our synchronous lessons right now. Um, we have a ton of routines, norming, procedures. Um, that are being reviewed and you, we will continue to be reviewing them, especially with our youngest learners. Uh, there's a lot of repetition. Um, I've seen that on a lot of social media, like I, I heard, could you mute your, uh, your Google Meet a hundred times today, this morning? So we will continue to uh, review those procedures. Um, our teachers typically spend this time uh, to cover the same topics when we're face to face. Um, so it's important to build those relationships, especially in this remote world that we're living right now. Um, we'll continue to focus on building, especially our literacy around technology and the use of technology as we navigate uh, this new way of learning and teaching. Uh, this week, I've heard so many great stories from teachers, from principals today 
and families that I've talked to this past week. Um, and I look forward to the upcoming weeks ahead. It's been a great first week of school. I have heard nothing but positive remarks from all of uh, those mentioned above. And so I think we're off to the right start and uh, we'll spend some time going through all those procedures. So you will see that, you will hear that in your homes um, and just know that's what we typically do um, when we are face-to-face -face, and it's important to uh, build those relationships with our kids and start the year off right. And uh, so they're, they're feeling safe and they, can, uh, they will want to take risk in our remote learning. Okay, should we turn it over to Ben to talk about some of our new platforms? <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Ben Rader, Supervisor of Secondary Education. So as you recall in the spring when we realized that uh, this school year 2021 was gonna be um, really unconventional and we would really have to make some big changes, we decided that we were gonna need to adopt a learning management system, an LMS. And um, it, it's a big undertaking. Districts who, who undertake this usually give themselves 12 to 18 months of lead time to select a product, to learn about it, to get their staff up and running. Um, but we knew we didn't have the luxury of that type of time. So um, we amassed a team this summer and obviously adopted um, Canvas as our choice. And uh, in a short period of time, we've been able to get it up and running, um, you know, and we're, we're in, we were implemented and ready to go for the first day of school. Um, last week, teachers received about an hour and a half, or sorry, a day and a half of professional development on the implementation of Canvas. Um, I want to really highlight and thank uh, a handful of uh, teacher leaders that have really stood out and really stepped up and helped us out tremendously with learning about it, delivering professional development, and then supporting their peers through this process. Uh, Steve Chisnell, Emma Dunn, Jill Hill, Alyssa Reimold, uh, Kim Logie Bates, Elke Guthrie, Jeanette McLeod, Jennifer Van Every, Jeremy Lekovitz, Catherine Sloan, Kirsten Liesma, and I'm sure I've missed some others, but you know it's really important to highlight all the great work that these teachers have done in supporting one another and getting um, this LMS and Canvas up and running. Um, you'll see that this is gonna be a slow um, rollout you know, Lisa just talked about the real importance of the first couple of weeks really being about student-centered, social-emotional learning, the new environment and um, learning approach. Um, you know, certainly many, if not most of our teachers have slowly began to introduce Canvas to their students. But if you haven't seen it yet, you will in the coming days. Um, this is a purposeful, approach to how we want to roll this thing out. We do not want it to be a stressor for students in these, um, the first couple of weeks. Um, so to assist with the delivery of um, remote learning, we also have two video conferencing tools, um, Google Meet, which uh, we were using last spring, but we also added WebEx um, to, our, to our toolbox as well. Um, WebEx you know, offers some more robust tools in terms of um, uh, being able to moderate conversations and do breakout rooms and a little bit more than Google Meet. Um, although Google Meet in mid-October is promising some real big improvements for their product and for their platform. So we'll have uh, two great options to, to get us through this year and into the future. Thank you. Questions for us? Mrs. Anderson. Do we still have students who are in need of technology or, or have we bridged that gap? I would, as of today, I believe that we are able to do finish up this the, the request that we have as of today. So, or maybe another day or two, but we're trying to be very, um, extremely, extremely accurate on our inventory and our assignment and how we assign them and keep track. And we have been very careful not to invite families in for any distribution if we don't feel that we have them or they're ready. So far, yes. Um, but uh, we are ordering more. That's why we have a resolution tonight um, here because 
we could need more and certainly non-working devices or devices when they break is also going to be a concern. It is a concern everywhere. Um, so, yeah, so far we have been able to keep up so far. Thank you. This is Dan Heitzman, did you have a question? Um, yeah, so so at this point, uh, just to reiterate, so all our families that we're aware of that have completed the survey um, have the technology needs fulfilled. And so everybody has access to a Chromebook um, or a system. We have a Chromebook. So the families that have filled it out in the past few days haven't received it yet because it takes the technology department a few days to package them up in preparation and schedule a delivery. Like I said, it, once a family re, um, completes the survey, the team will prepare it and schedule a time for pickup. They don't like to promise it ahead of time. They only like to know that they have enough and then do it. So there are probably uh, some in the past few days and those are be will be handed out in the schools next week. We just made a plan for that. So all the, so all the requests that have been made up until this afternoon um, principals are sending um, emails to those families who made those requests up until this afternoon to pick them up in their buildings next week. And the students, those requests that we have coming in, so school started this week. So those mm -hmm. students have tech, access to technology used for their learning? Everybody, we had a huge, we handed out over 20, oh man, 2,300 um, Chromebooks before school started, and we never closed the survey because we didn't want to, you know, cut cut it off. But they kept coming in, so we're just keeping up as fast as we can. So yes, I mean the twenty three hundred went out before school started, and then as I said, Monday and Tuesday this week we grabbed several hundred more that came in late last week. Okay, I guess I guess we, my question is just if their requests are still coming in, do those people are use, are they using some backup technology at this point? Um, and have, I guess, have we asked that question? So those that are still asking for technology, have we, you know, have assurance that they have access? We have, we have phone calls here in our department. We're taking phone calls every day. And when we, we have, um, we have made some special deliveries um, to, to answer your question. We are taking phone calls and um, meeting with people and talking with them and sort of the principals. And we think special deliveries to make sure people were really couldn't wait a day or two. Um, my other question, it might be a Ben question, is just in regards to, um, you know, I've heard some comments, there were some challenges with families having WebEx issues and things of that nature. And I know it's the first week and people are using new tools. Um, are, are there any sorts of, and this is for the tech people, any compatibility challenges or did we provide any folks with just some, you know, um, tools on how to use the systems and ensure that everything was compatible? Yeah, our, we haven't, to our knowledge, run into any compatibility issues. These, um, you know, these uh, platforms are pretty agnostic. Um, and, you know, we've provided guidance for our teachers on how to facilitate these. Um, I think some of the, the initial, you know, glitches, I think were pretty unavoidable. I know we had them here in my household with my kids. Um, and we're going to continue to work with the tech department and work with families and work with teachers to kind of, you know, make it a smoother, um, more glitch-free process, if you will. And, and just one more clarification. So I know um, technology resources too for some of the staff that were, they were gonna be receiving some new technology. Have all of those been fulfilled at this point? I can answer. I can answer that. Yes, we ordered uh, laptops for the high school teachers that, that was, they were reg regularly scheduled. This is, you know, prior to uh, COVID or anything. The high school teachers were due in the fall of 2020 uh, for their new laptops and those laptops were ordered and delivered, yes. We did not order, those were the only uh, new uh, uh, staff uh, technology devices that were ordered. Thank you, any other questions for the curriculum group? This is Fitzpatrick. Thank you. I, I just want to reiterate that in the spring, uh, from March to June, we were closed and we deployed about 700 Chromebooks to families of need with a similar survey asking, uh, you know, who needed that technology. 
my guess is the difference between that and now the roughly 2,300 additional devices that we're deploying from you know the buildings out to the families would be that the um, demands on the family and their you know means to provide technology uh, should they have a computer or a device in their home uh, is now up for a lot of competition with multiple students or parents working from home as well and so we really have seen in the last three weeks um, you know three times as many and we had 700 now it's 2300 brand new requests for this tech to go out to them um, so it, it's a lot more than uh, that we had originally put out to the families but as Sarah has said as calls have come in and uh, people without any access. We're also talking to families of need that might have uh, connectability, um, you know, um, ability to con connect with the internet, uh, connectivity issues and such. And so we're navigating those as well, uh, in addition to the hard uh, device and the technology that we're giving them. Um, and then our teachers are, are also uh, able to come in to their classrooms and teach from in their class if they'd like. Um, there are some challenges with some of their family members or small children um, you know, where they don't want to risk and can't be at risk to be in the classrooms. But for the most part, our staff have been in and out of their own teaching spaces and accessing their tools that they have also had uh, throughout the regular school year. This is Van Heitzma. Um, just another question to go back um, to the special ed students. So as we've been meeting with those students now and, you know, the concerns about um, you know, them staying current and, or, you know, having a greater um, um, loss, if you will, from, from loss of instruction. And what is the feedback that we're hearing from those parents? Are they um, feeling comfortable with the plans that are in place? I know Jane is there somewhere. Um, yeah, here I am. Um, the, you know, we've been meeting with many, many families this week. Um, because we've been working on contingency learning plans. And so that involves the family and the staff as well. Um, I know the feedback from the middle school has been um, just, just the meeting time virtually face-to-face -face has been, you know, greatly appreciated um, because we've been able just to have those face-to-face -face conversations with a team of people and, and listen carefully and, you know, ask some questions and, and have a better understanding. Um, so I don't I don't think things are perfect right now, but I do believe that um, families are feeling um, that they've been heard and that they understand what you know what we're doing and moving forward, um, and that actually MDE and the Office of Special Education has provided um, guidance for it. Um, it's called Impact Services, so COVID Impact Services. And um, they they have given us guidance from now until December um, to review data and meet with families and look to see. They really want us to compare the general ed students data with the special ed students data to see if there was more significant loss. So they have they have a bit of an equation there for us to look at. So it's just not. Uh, it's just not someone saying, I think my child has lost X amount of, of information or learning. Um, it's, it's more of a, again, like an equation there. Um, of course, we realize that, um, you know, here in Roy Oak and especially in our special ed department, um, that we, 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 we care about our students and families. And if there's something that we can do to help bridge the gap, we've always been able to deliver. So long story short, we're gonna we're gonna work case by case, Marianne, to make sure that we um, address those needs with families and hear them and work together. Thank you. Any further questions for the curriculum team? Thank you very much. With that, we will move to Item 4.2, Finance Facilities and Bond. Mrs. Isabella. Good evening, thank you. First, I'd like to begin by reminding everybody that food service is delivering meals at both Royal Oak High School and Royal Oak Middle School, Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. You can pick up for multiple days and for multiple students, and the students do not have to be a part of Royal Oak Schools. This is for all 18 and younger and those with special needs under the age of 26. 
The, accept, the acceptance of the audit is item 9.5 on tonight's agenda. I'd like to thank David Youngstrom for his presentation and his staff um, at Yo and Yo. It was a different year, this audit, but it was seamless and completed well. I can't do it without everyone in the district having an eye on the policies and procedures every day. The finance staff of Kim Boyce, Colleen Hello, Anne Marie Carlisle, Donna Judd, and Melissa John Cox all did a great job, not just during the audit, but every day to have such a successful audit. The final member of finance is Pam Greer, who is retiring effective September 30th. And she has always been instrumental in our district and she will be sorely missed. So I'd like to thank Pam Greer for her 24 years of service to the students of Royal Oak. Sorry, get a little choked up. It's gonna be a big loss for our department. Um, in June, we cut Schedule B activities and clubs by 50% due to budget constraints that we believe we're going to be part of the state of Michigan's budget. While the state budget is not yet complete, we are a little more optimistic at this time and would like to recommend fully funding those activities and clubs at the 2019-2020 level. That recommendation is 9.8 on tonight's agenda. I also have two items that are construction related for you to consider. 9.7 is a, is a um, is for quality environmental contract change order. Um, they do asbestos work. There was some small additional work that we needed to have them do at Royal Oak High School in Oakland Elementary. So we're bringing this small change order back for your consideration. 9.6 is a boiler replacement contract award at Royal Oak Middle School. We had a request for proposal that was open this Tuesday. We received seven bids. We'd like to award the contract to the low bidder. They have satisfactorily had also had their post bid meeting. You'll see that we have a not to exceed amount. There were two different boiler systems and we're still trying to determine which will fit our building best, but we would like to proceed with CSM mechanical as the low bidder for both types of boilers. Are there any questions before I proceed with the rest of my presentation? All right, seeing none, I'd like to, to remind everyone that Nove the November 2020 election ballot includes a question for Royal Oak Schools voters to renew and restore both the non-homestead 18 mills and the whole harmless millage for a period of 10 years. Both millages will appear in one ballot question. The state of Michigan expects that we collect the full amount of both the non-homestead millage as well as the whole harmless millage. The state does not make up for it when we do not collect it through this voter approved millage. The non homestead millage is for non homestead properties. So this does not affect a resident's primary home. The hold harmless millage is levied on primary residences and will be restored to its previous level of 3.4 mills. But we collect $851 per student with this millage in this year's um, is 2.29 mills. Both of these millages have been in place since 1994. These two millages rates combined generate $23 million for the district for general operations. And that 23 million represents 46% of the revenue of our foundation allowance or the general operating revenue of our district. The foundation allowance for the 2019-2020 school year was $9,118 per student. Of that, $4,220 is collected locally and stays locally with these levies. Without these millages, our foundation allowance would be reduced to $4,898 per student at the 2019-2020 levels. We still don't know what our 2020-2020 21 foundation allowance will be until the state budget is complete. The loss of funding would cause the district to make tough choices to reduce our budget, which might include program cuts, increased class sizes, layoffs, and service cuts. The ballot language has already been approved by the Board of Education during the July meeting and has been submitted to be placed on the ballot. Are there any questions regarding the ballot language before I move forward with the bond update. 
Seeing none. I'm sorry, I always have trouble finding the one I want. So we'll see if it's the right one. I'm sorry, I don't know why it's not opening the correct. It's just opening my screen. I have it open. I can see it. Paula, do you happen to have that available? I'm not, I can see it on my screen and it's not. Okay, well, I have some lovely pictures of Royal Oak High School in Oakland Elementary. I don't know why I can't seem to get it to come forward. Hold on, I'm, I'm about to share it. Okay, great. Then I'll stop giving that away. So construction continues at both Royal Oaks High School and Oakland Elementary. There we go. Thank you, Paula. I appreciate your help. Um, there's some, the flooring has been mostly completed at Royal Oak High School. The things that are still left are in front of the auditorium. They were working on that the other day, so it could be complete now. In front of the main gym and around the cafeteria spaces. But this is the new design at Royal Oak High School. Next slide, please. This is one picture of the new cafeteria space at Royal Oak High School. Um, I was there a couple of days ago and they put the wraps around those posts and all of the furniture was being delivered the day that I was there and it, and it really looked sharp in there. Next slide, please. These are some other pictures of that cafeteria space looking the other way. So this is the south and west wall. There's a beautiful um, ceramic tile feature walls there. Next slide, please. And then this is the entryway. Um, like I said, a lot of that flooring's being replaced out there in that hallway, but it's a, it's a really nice glass entryway into that cafeteria. The space is a lot larger than it was. And it, and it looks really nice. I think it's gonna be a great space for students. Next slide, please. Now, this is one of the locker rooms. Um, all the tile work has uh, been worked on. Um, so just so you get an idea of what that's gonna look like. They continue to work on that. I understand there's now ceiling and some other stuff. Here's a few pictures of Oakland Elementary. There's quite a bit of site work that was done. This appears to be on the uh, east side of the building. Next slide, please. On the left is the south parking lot. And then of course, uh, the, other is, the other picture on the right is the north side where there's gonna be a retention pond where the new addition is. Next slide, please. And then there's a, a nice picture of that new addition that's gonna, um, be completed for students when they arrive um, that houses a new cafeteria, kitchen, set of bathrooms, and a classroom. Next slide, please. Here's some pictures of the, the new flooring that's at Oakland Elementary, a little bit different design than they used at Royal Oak High School using the colors of Oakland. You can see the red in the flooring, looks really nice. Next slide. And then on the left is a picture of the art room, um, the new cabinetry that went in and the flooring there. And then on the right is the learning commons. Um, really like how those windows turned out, how that um, you can see the red, they used a lot of color in those areas. I think it's gonna also be a really nice space for students. So one more Paula or is that the end? I think that's it. 
So that's all I have for you this evening. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take any. Mrs. Van Heitsma. Um, I just actually have a comment. So the, the, the space looks amazing. I mean, just from the photos, the, the transition for that high school is amazing. It just looks so different. And Oakland, I know they're just going to be so thrilled to have this new space when they can finally be in there. It's just amazing, the, cha the change. I agree. Mrs. Anderson. I can vouch that Oakland looks great, at least from the outside. Um, it is looking wonderful, and I'm really happy that that school is getting some attention. I do want to add that pretty much everything on your report was covered at last week's facilities and finance meeting and uh, those meetings, those committee meetings are open to the public and we welcome participation and hope more people will join us. Thank you. Any other questions for Mrs. Isabella? I see none. With that, we will move on to 4.3, Staff and Student Services. Mr. Walensky. Well, thank you, Mr. Brinker, and good evening, everyone. Um, sounds funny to start with this by saying that this was a busy summer. I mean, I, obviously, you all know that um, just countless hours um, on the part of our administrators, uh, teachers, the back to school task force, um, it feels like we never left. We never left for the summer. But in addition to all of the back to school planning, um, I don't think people forgot, but I'll remind you that um, we did a lot of hiring. We did a lot of interviews. We actually hired 20 new, 26 new staff members um, between May and today. I actually hired or um, signed a contract with our 26 new hire just today. So those 26 new hires, um, that process involves screening a lot of applicants, um, a lot of interviews. We had over 200 virtual interviews. And I want to thank and acknowledge our principals and um, teachers who participate in that process as well. Um, it's always exciting and feels good to hire new teachers. It's a bit odd having teachers right out of student teaching starting their career in this way but um, they're they're optimistic and positive regardless um, last tuesday was our welcome back um, as was mentioned earlier which we typically have at don darrow and you, when you get up there you look out in the auditorium and see a sea of uh, 500 employees and there's a lot of energy and it's very exciting um, we had to do it virtually this year so instead you know myself in the board office staff were in the boardroom and I was looking at an audience of five people and speaking into my laptop. So it was a little different. And I was, I kind of felt bad that we couldn't introduce our new staff. Um, so we came up with something a little different, which we're going to share with you tonight. Um, we had each one of them just do a self video with their cell phone, introducing themselves where they're going to teach and then um, say something, a fun fact about themselves. So, I really liked it. I got a lot of positive feedback from it. One of our new hires, Mary Sire, who's actually a graduate of Royal Oak High School, our new um, WOAK station manager, um, worked with the staff to put this together. So well, if you could, let's play that now. So, Paul, I can't hear it, and it's very choppy. I don't believe it's playing appropriately, Paula.
That's too bad. Hold, if you give me one second, I can see if I can um, add it. Mr. Walensky, I'll just add that um, typically also at this board meeting, if we were in person, each one of these staff members would be with us. And I know in years past, they've brought family members and spouses and children um, you know, to that meeting so that we could have a chance to talk with them all in person, as well as introduce them to the board. And uh, we've been having them on video uh, to show our community it would be the same as if we were at the building um, introducing themselves. So uh, we, we missed that this year without a face-to-face -face board meeting, but uh, we're hopeful that uh, this is helpful for everyone. I'm trying one more time. Let me know how this goes. In Royal Oak. I am from Flint, Michigan, and I've been teaching for six years uh, in Flint, Pontiac, and most recently in Dearborn Heights. Something interesting about me is that I try to start to read a new book every single week. Hi, my name is Randy Olette, and I will be teaching fourth grade at Adams Elementary School. I am from Waterford, and one fun fact about me is that I play the tuba. I am Rose Aether. I'll be teaching first grade at Upton Elementary. I'm from Royal Oak. I went to school here, graduated from John Darrow. A uh, fun fact about me is that I like to garden and I make my family grow vegetables with me in the backyard. Hi everyone. My name is Jessica Wynn. I am a newly hired speech and language pathologist for Royal Oak Schools. Um, I will be working at Shrine Catholic Elementary School and Royal Oak High School. Um, I've been a speech and language pathologist for two and a half years and I'm loving every bit of it. Um, prior to working for Royal Oak, I was previously in a clinical setting, um, but I'm really excited to make the transition over to working in the schools and um, working as a team to uh, meet the needs of our students. Um, I, a fun fact about myself is that I was born in Vietnam. I came here when I was five and um, a good amount of my family still lives over there. So I do love traveling back and forth. My name is Catherine Bortolotti. I'm from West Bloomfield, Michigan, and I'll be teaching first grade at Northwood Elementary. A fun fact about me is this summer, I rescued a dog named Lucy from Texas. Hello, my name is Jan McConnell. I'm the new kindergarten teacher at Oak Ridge, and I'm originally from Grand Rapids, Michigan. A fun fact about me is that I love houseplants. I think that they're so cute, and I cannot stop buying them. See you later. Hi, my name is Jessica Knoll. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the Royal Oak School District. I am originally from Holland, Michigan. I'm a University of Michigan graduate, and I have over 20 years of teaching experience. I am excited to be teaching Algebra 2 at Royal Oak High School. Um, a fun fact about me, I think just about everybody developed a new pandemic hobby, and mine is kayaking. Hi, my name is Miranda Torres, and I am teaching science at Royal Oak Middle School. I am from Royal Oak, and a fun fact about me is my dad graduated from Dondero, so I am really happy to be getting to teach in his old building. Hi, my name is Megan McCaffrey. I am going to be a new teacher this year at um, Royal Oak High School as an academic support teacher. Um, I am from Grand Rapids. So actually, I'm originally from South Korea. I was adopted from there. That is my fun fact about me. Um, but I grew up on the west side, um, so I just moved here. Um, this is the new office space that's actually my desk over there. I'm just using my roommate's desk for this video because I'm not as backlit. Um, but yeah, right now just transitioning into beginning the school year and moving into a new place. Hola, mi nombre es Claudia Ortiz. Hello, my name is Claudia Ortiz. This year, I will be joining the wonderful language department at Royal Oak High School as a Spanish teacher. I am from the borderland city of El Paso, Texas, which is known as the Sun City. Growing up in El Paso provided me with the opportunity of being bilingual and bicultural. I have been here in Michigan for the past four years, and I like it very, very much. But I do have to confess that driving on ice is not my favorite. <laughs> I am very excited to become part of the Royal Oak Schools family. 
I am positive this will be a unique and wonderful school year. As I always say, adios, hasta luego, nos vemos. Hello Ravens. I am Heather Cleland Host, and I will be teaching Algebra, Geometry, and Physics at Royal Oak High School this year. I am from Midland, where I was teaching Physics at Delta College and at SVSU. I moved here last year with my partner and my four sons. And a fun fact, I have seen the Northern Lights from above during a flight over the North Pole to China. I look forward to meeting all of you. Hi, my name is Abby Lynn Cardelli. I will be teaching first grade at Adams Elementary School. I grew up in Pleasant Ridge and I currently live in Oak Park. And a fun fact about me is my fiance and I rescued a three-year-old dog back in March. Hello, my name is Michaela Stafford. I'll be teaching first grade at Adams this year. It'll actually be my first year teaching. I'm originally from Stafford, Virginia, but I just moved here from Little Beach, South Carolina, where I went to Coastal Carolina University. And a little fun fact about myself is that I love to read. I actually just read six books this past month, and my goal for the year is 12. Hi, Royal Oak Schools community. My name is Amy Price, and I will be teaching Earth Science and Physics this fall. I'm originally from the Thumb of Michigan, a small town called Kingston, but currently live in the Livonia area. Some interesting facts about me. I studied exclusively Shakespeare for a spring semester in college, even though I'm a science major. And I have three kids, an 11-year-old son and twin one-year-old daughters. I look forward to this school year, and I'm excited to start my new career at Royal Oak Schools. Bye. Hi, my name is Jen Romanchuk. I am an occupational therapist. I went to Eastern Michigan University and graduated in 2007 with my master's degree. I am going to be at Keller, Oak Ridge, Oakland, Shrine Academy, Shrine, and St. Paul's. And I have one adopted daughter and one biological daughter. Um, and I am so excited to be here at Royal Oak. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jenna Katula and I am the new French teacher at Royal Oak Middle School. I'm from Troy and a fun fact about me is that I love to scuba dive, particularly with sharks. I am so excited to join the Royal Oak School community. Hi, my name is Michael Carmen. I will be teaching English and Social Studies this year at Royal Oak High School. I grew up in Frankenmuth, but I have lived in the Detroit area for my adult life, uh, and I now live right here in Royal Oak. Uh, a fun fact about myself, I once uh, engaged in a contest to eat a stick of butter the fastest with a student, uh, and the student beat me quite handily. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Hello, my name is Hannah Kaiser. Um, I am the new developmental kindergarten teacher at Keller Elementary. I actually am originally from Indiana and I moved to Michigan to go to school at Oakland University and then I just decided that I loved the area and I was going to stay. And so I just moved to Royal Oak Clawson area and I love it. And fun fact about me is I love Oreo ice cream. My name is Hagan Cholakian. I am a second grade teacher at Adams. I am from Farmington Hills, and my fun fact is that I am bilingual. I'm so excited to be part of the Royal Oak School District. Hi, my name is Laura Khan, and I am going to be the new 4-5 loop teacher at Adams Elementary. This is my fourth year teaching fourth grade, eighth year teaching and all. I am so excited for this opportunity. I currently live in Brandon Township, and one of my favorite things to do is to be active and run. Hi, my name is Mary Sire. I am the WOAK station manager. I was born and raised in Royal Oak. And a fun fact about myself is I was a foreign exchange student in Finland for a summer. Hi there, my name is Sarah Ross and I'm the new first grade teacher at Oakland Elementary. I was the learning specialist there for the past two years. I live in Berkeley with my husband and my three kids. And one fun fact about me is I was a competitive swimmer at Michigan State University many years ago. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vishon Strong. Uh, it's so good to be in Royal Oak. I hope everyone is staying happy, staying safe, staying healthy. I am the new middle school counselor here at Royal Oak. I have been in education for about, I think this is about my 19th year. Um, I'm a former English teacher, and I've also been in the field of counseling for a few years. Um, fun fact about me, uh, I like to hear and tell funny jokes. I think my absolute favorite joke is, why was six afraid of seven? Ready? Because seven, eight, nine. <laughs> Well, thank you, Paula. That's uh, just a little introduction to the 26 new hydrants minus two that we've learned this far. I'm sorry, um, as Fitzpatrick said, we weren't able to have them in person at the board office tonight as we usually do. But Mr. Kulinski, yeah. I'm sorry. I, we, had a re we did miss a couple of people at the very beginning and we just, with the text, so we just want to replay just the first uh, two people. Oh, okay. Them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kayla Sikorpis, and I am the new second grade teacher at Keller Elementary School. I'm originally from Rochester Hills, and I am so excited to be joining Royal Oak Schools this year. A fun fact about me is that I lived in Spain for two summers, and I absolutely love learning new things and practicing my Spanish. Hi, my name is Teresa Graham, and I'm from Grand Blanc, Michigan. I'll be starting as an accountant. And a fun fact about me is that food is my happy place. Mm -hmm. I love to talk about food. so. If you need someone to go to on your cheat day for your diet, I am your girl. I've got a good reason for you to eat whatever it is that you want to eat to make you happy. Hi, my name is Katie Bantamasi, and I will be teaching developmental kindergarten this year at Adams. I'm very excited to be in Royal Oak. I am from Flint, Michigan, and I've been teaching for six years uh, in Flint, Pontiac, and most recently in Dearborn Heights. Something interesting about me is that I try to start to read a new book every single week. Hi, my name is Randy Olet, and I will be teaching fourth grade at Adams Elementary School. I am from Waterford, and one fun fact about me is that I play the tuba. Is that where we left off, I believe? Yeah, I believe that is. I think so. Thanks, Paula. We have um, two positions remaining to be filled, uh, elementary music teacher and uh, assistant principal for Royal Oak High School, as Ms. Powell took the um, supervisor of adult and alternative high school position at Churchill this year. So. Two position positions remaining to be filled, which hopefully in the next two weeks will be. And that's my report. Any questions? This is Anderson. Uh, thank you for sharing that video. I thought that was great. Um, I always look forward to meeting the new staff and unfortunately it's not in person this year, but that was a great introduction. Is that video on our website or, or can people see that video or no? I don't believe it's on our website right now, but we certainly could link it. It is. Oh, is it? Okay. It is. I checked before I got it before the okay. meeting, so it is on there. Excellent. Mrs. Van Heitzma, did you have a question? Mr. Walensky, that was a great video. Although I miss meeting all the new teachers, that video was great, and I am not going to eat a stick of butter. Just saying. Thank yeah, you. Sorry, it didn't play a little better, but it was it was really nice on opening day, and several people told me they preferred it to me having them stand and wave and listen to me just say their name. So maybe we start a new tradition. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Walensky? I see none. With that, we will move on to 4.4, .4, cultural competence engagement. Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Brinker. Um, some of the things that we've been working on over the summer and then into the fall uh, include updating our web page for our diversity, equity, and inclusion work of the district. We want it to be inclusive of work from individual buildings and levels, as well as other groups uh, and organizations and work that the district level um, cultural competence engagement committee is doing. And so Amy Murphy, our communications specialist, has been working with a number of uh, groups and teachers to 
expand that web page and make it all inclusive of our work kind of in a single landing spot. Um, that is still a work in progress um, as we're migrating some of the things over from former pages uh, and merging them so that our work is highlighted all in the same spot. So uh, in the uh, weeks to come, we'll be highlighting that single uh, new web page and all of the resources that are there for our parents. Um, our subcommittees of the Cultural Competence Engagement Committee have been meeting virtually um, throughout um, the month of August, and there's some meetings going on here in September. Um, those groups are working on um, moving from the goal area uh, statements that have been written and now including action items under each goal and really exploring new ideas about how we can make our goals a reality uh, and continue to progress within the district on our, our focus goal areas. And then lastly, uh, our next meeting will be on September the 29th at 6.30 p.m. That is a virtual meeting. And that will be all of the members of the Cultural Competence Engagement Committee coming back together to share the progress that the breakout committees and subcommittees have been able to uh, achieve thus far. Um, along with some other activities, we'll be holding an, an agenda setting meeting with a, a group of folks to make sure that that is all inclusive of the work that's been done so far and um, other ideas that we have for that meeting. Uh, we will publish that meeting link so that anyone who would like to join us uh, would be able to, uh, and just so that we can accommodate the group size um, from the number of folks that have offered to be on that and have shown interest in doing that um, from our statements and the community messages and also our survey, I will be virtual um, starting again at 6.30. So um, if you are interested in listening to this report, you can contact Mr. Ioannis. He's our principal over at Adams Elementary and he would be glad to take your name and include you on our list um, to continue in this good work. Thank you, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Any questions for Mrs. Fitzpatrick? I see none. With that, we will move on to item five, public comment. To make a public comment request during this virtual board meeting, please use the raise your hand button to request to speak for public comment. When I read your name, you'll be unmuted and you will have three minutes to speak. Please state your name and address for the record. There are two opportunities in this meeting for public comment. Public comment is not intended for the exchange of dialogue. This is a time for members of the public to express their views. We are paying attention to your comments and appreciate them. However, school board members generally do not respond to public comments during the meeting. Questions that arrive from public comments shall be referred to the superintendent or her designee for review, study, and possible future results. I'm sorry, response. With that, I see a couple of people. Let's start with Orit Milligan. Hi, can everyone hear me? We can. Great. My name is Orit Milligan and I live on North Maple Avenue and have two middle school kids. We are requesting the board to require an immediate change for the middle school remote program. The middle school has only three days per week for regularly occurring live instruction. Additionally, there are only two core classes being taught. We are concerned about math not being year round and about the limited live sessions at the middle school. Um, I sent everyone in the board a chart that compared the Royal Oak Middle School with nearby districts, which are also remote. I compared it with uh, Bloomfield Hills and Birmingham. The number of core classes being taught per week um, in the middle school in Royal Oak is two, and in Bloomfield Hills and Birmingham it's four, or all the core classes. Live online instruction per week for core classes in Royal Oak is six hours per week, and it's 20 hours in Bloomfield Hills and Birmingham. Days per week that include live online instruction in Royal Oak is three, and in both Bloomfield Hills and Birmingham, it's five. Math is not year round in the middle school in Royal Oak but it is in the middle schools in Bloomfield Hills and Birmingham. We debated whether to write him to say this immediately or to wait and see how things go. However, the information that I just stated will not change. And with quarters being so short, the longer we, we wait, the more our children are at a competitive disadvantage in comparison to other districts academically. 
please consider requiring math year-round and increasing live instruction to five days per week. Note that other parents we have discussed this topic with agree with us and request an immediate change. Uh, thank you and please respond to me as soon as you can. Thank you very much. I see Amanda Willis. Hi. Hello. We can. This is Amanda Willis. I live at 422 Detroit Avenue. I have three children in the Royal Oak schools, two of them at Oak Ridge Elementary and a middle schooler at ROMS. Similar to what you heard a moment ago, with respect to ROMS, my middle school child is a special education student. And there was a question asked earlier of how the parents are feeling. We are not feeling good. We do not feel like we are being served the right education for our children. He has not had any classes, but one this week, and it was not a special education class. The schedule is erratic. The one class he has is at three different times on the three days they're being instructed, which does not help consistency and help grow and learn. I need to advocate for my kids in both the middle school and at the elementary that they receive the four core subjects. Consistent from what you heard earlier, other districts in Oakland County are educating kids in these subjects. Our kids will continue to fall further behind if we don't do that. At a minimum, we education at the middle school four days a week. Additionally, we're not using tools that help our children to learn. They need to have access to Zoom immediately. The breakout rooms that were spoke of are not happening. WebEx fails our children, and it's not creating the best learning environment for them. There was a question asked earlier about Canvas. Rounds just received an email today. We're still not using it. So there's a lack of consistency on how our kids are getting information about what classes to, to gain access to. My special education child must click in an email to find a link to access his class and try to figure out what day of the week and what time he should join. It's not acceptable and we're failing our kids. When will these concerns be answered? We need immediate support to make changes for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see Danielle Atkinson. Walnut, uh, Royal Oak, Michigan, obviously. Um, I am asking that we be a data driven district. Um, so, my main concern is still the same about diversity and inclusion and disparities. I need the board, we need the board to ask specifically for discipline and academic um, data by race and ethnicity so that we can address the problem. Also, with us being remote um, in conjunction, but kind of in contrast with the, the last two speakers, what is the best practice for teaching children remotely based on their age? Does it, I need a school psychologist, I need a developmental specialist telling us that it is okay for our children to be in front of a screen for four hours, or it is not developmentally appropriate or acceptable for them to be um, being taught this way for four days a week. I need the decisions that we make as a district to be data driven. Um, and, you know, I need to see the receipts because I am trusting you. I'm putting four children in front of a screen saying, okay, this is, this is just the, amount of instruction that you need to stay relevant on, on your education and to not be overloaded. Um, like the other speakers, my children are, are a little frustrated right now. I think there are some fixes like calendar invites and there are just some simple fixes that could really help with student frustration and assimilation to this process. But main thing is we need to be a data-driven district. Thanks so much. Thank you, Daniel. I see Lisa Haynes. 
Yes, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Lisa Haynes. I live at 4003 North Blair Avenue in Royal Oak. I have two children in the Royal Oak schools, both at the high school. And I have to say, we're doing okay there at the high school. Uh, my comment is um, regarding diversity. I have to say, I did enjoy watching that video. The amount of um, teachers of color was very, um, very heartwarming, I guess, is the word I'll use. It was nice to see all the wonderful rainbows of the new teachers that we hired. My question is, um, there have been many requests that have put, been put out there to the school board in regards to having a meeting with Rampa, and they have fallen on deaf ears. We have yet to have a school board and Rampa meeting, and this has been these requests have been going on for months and years. Um, the fact that something hasn't been set up is being perceived by our organization as not being valued by our school board. I would hope that each of you would value Rampa and the work that we've done and the way that we have passionately been supporting our children and all the children of the school district and asking you to please move forward in the way that we teach and support and safeguard our children. So what I would like to ask is that a meeting is set up within the next 30 days because we cannot push this to side any longer. Thank you so much and I hope everyone stays safe. Thank you, Lisa. Christina West. Hi, my name is Christina West. I live at 3608 West Webster. I have two children at Upton and one at Roms. Um, I have a couple of statements to make. First, I am also concerned about the low amount of live instruction for the middle school. Three days a week is just not enough. And three classes, I understand that. But students need to be kept on track and three days is just not enough. Secondly, I'm also asking when the board will directly address and meet with Rampa of the open letter that was sent several weeks ago now. Um, and thirdly, I'd like to know um, what kind of technical help is there any being is there any additional IT people being used to help with Chromebook issues. We have a lot of parents who are having issues, myself included. When you call the phone number, you just get a message that you have to go online and put in a ticket. I've done that a couple days ago with no response yet. I have other parents who have told me they can't even turn on their Chromebooks and have no way of getting help for this because nobody's responding. So I'd like to know if there is additional IT help happening to uh, work with this issue with so many Chromebooks out there. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jeannie Beard Dada. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time. First, I want to acknowledge the important work of Rampa and voice my support for what they're working to accomplish. The weight of this work should not be on the shoulders of families of color. But I believe the diversity of our new hires reflects the diligent work that they have been that has been done by them for over the last three years. Additionally, for the sake of everyone's time, a meeting dedicated specifically to addressing the concerns of Rampa would be more appropriate. I'm here to share my thoughts on the recent board resolution on diversity as an educator, a Royal Oak community member, and the mother of a child of color. To begin, as our governor de has declared that racism is a public health crisis, it would be immoral for us to remain passive. The Royal Oak School District needs to have an explicit and continuous commitment to anti-racist training and curriculum. This commitment must be made through a public statement that is visible for all families. If the Royal Oak School District is not willing to remove police and security from their schools, despite the existing research, which suggests that schools that do utilize security generally demonstrate non-significant impacts on reducing actual violence, while at the same time are associated with students reporting 
greater feelings of feeling unsafe, then the district needs to commit to eliminating interactions between students and security staff when not in the presence of their guardians. Police should never be called on students in the absence of a deadly weapon. There needs to be an aggressive campaign from the school district and their leaders for equitable funding for all Michigan schools to address the funding disparity that exists for schools that primarily serve communities of color. We cannot claim to be anti-racist or appreciate diversity if we are not openly addressing one of the main ways that racism is weaponized against children in schools. Royal Oak School District must stop making empty commitments that bode well for optics. The district has to stop hiding behind diversity and multiculturalism as these are terms that are often used to whitewash what should be explicitly anti-racist efforts. Additionally, the all students matter narrative has to stop. Of course, all of our students matter, and we know that. But the district must show its commitment to this by proving that black students matter through substantive policy changes and measurable actions. Measurable goals and actions must be put into writing in order for us to hold each other accountable. The district should make efforts to identify staff that are interested in anti-racist work and allow them to lead their coworkers. The district must make it clear that students of color are not there to serve as examples for their peers. This sort of tokenism is harmful for students of color and sets a bad example for their white peers as to how they should view, how they should view their peers who are children of color. To this point, children of color need mirrors and white children need windows to view the world differently. The school district cannot rely on the guidance of Dr. J. Marks alone. Communities of color are not monolithic. The changes to curriculum must include efforts that empower students to challenge their own beliefs, biases, and provide them with the tools and environment that encourage self-exploration. Finally, all efforts must be made to identify and communicate with stakeholders regarding all the previous points. Additionally, as trust is low in the community, Royal Oak School District must continue to constantly communicate their efforts in these areas, as well as provide data monthly in a public forum. The school district should provide as many opportunities and various methods for obtaining feedback from families of color. So yes, as was previously, previously stated in tonight's meeting, cheers to all of us for being comfortable with being very uncomfortable. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Lakeisha Morrison. Good afternoon, guys. I, hopefully you guys can hear me. We can. Oh, good. My name is Lakeisha Morrison, address 1316 Millard Avenue, Roy Oak, Michigan. I have two children or three children, one in the school system, one just left. Um, she goes to Oak Ridge Elementary and my son just left the middle school. As a former student of Royal Oak um, from Lincoln Elementary or Lincoln Preschool all the way to Kimball High School, I'd like to say I'd love to see the diverse staff that we have but not much has changed. It's been 25 years and, the, and what I see is still the same. I still see the same faces and not enough different diversity in the staff. Um, as a mother, I'm hurt. The black community is hurting. I feel like there's not enough acknowledgement when it comes to families of uh, the black race or children of color. Rampa opened their arms to me some months ago when I felt like the community had it was their job to say something and go out their way to acknowledge the fact that we are hurting. Um, I held a few prote protests in Royal Oak and drew thousands of people and if thousands of people can acknowledge the fact that there's something wrong within our community and in our schools and our nation, I feel like the board should be able to acknowledge Rampa, the children, and the parents as well. Thank you guys so much, and hopefully one day we can all sit down at, at the table and get things adjusted to where all children feel accepted, black, brown, purple, pink, and all in between. Thank you. Tammy Miller. Let me turn that off. Tammy Miller, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, Tammy. Hi, I live at 2819 Benjamin Avenue. I have three kids in Adams Elementary. 
one third, one fifth, and one in developmental kindergarten. I just wanted to voice a concern of the special ed services being provided. I had a very different experience than Jane explained in the, earlier. On Wednesday, I had a meeting with his contingency plan and right off the bat, I was asked to approve the amendment without it even being reviewed with me, what the amendment was going to be. His services, so I said I needed to know what the amendment was and his services are being cut in half. He is being offered speech therapy twice a month, for, which is reduced from two to four. He was receiving it once a week, so he's only being offered speech and occupational therapy every other week. So for a developmentally delayed child who hasn't had services in six months, hasn't been assessed, the reduction in services is very concerning as he's already delayed. So how is he going to progress in this environment with reduced services? That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Cassandra Fitzgerald. Hello, hey school, hey uh, Raylook School Board. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. Um, I am actually a school employee for Royal Oak Schools. I work at Adams Elementary, and it was a pleasure to see all the new staff and the video shown at our welcome greet, as you had seen at the board meeting tonight, um, and as well as seeing what you guys were doing at the board meeting today. My my main concern, though, even though I am a paraeducator, I was looking at all the schedules for, um, for some of the teachers, and I do see that we were doing a lot of reading and math at the elementary level. I'm just more worried also that um, science skills and uh, learning about social studies, whether it be our community or core democratic values or the curriculum for social studies, what's that's gonna be looking like um, in the future and if that's gonna be covered, assuming that we uh, have to go virtual, um, I hate to say it, for the whole school year. But that that's basically all what I'm uh, here to talk about is I'm grateful for the diversity of the people that we've hired in the district. Um, I live at 2019 North Main Street, nearest school building is Northwood Elementary, um, but I always, um, Love to help out any building that needs it. So I'll leave it at that and everyone else have a great night. Thank you. Erica Alexander. Hi, um, thanks for the opportunity. I have a, a couple of different things I wanted to share. Um, I am at 3592 Arbor um, in Royal Oak and I have one child who is in sixth grade at ROMS. Um, I too share some concerns about the um, her only having two core classes um, and only three days of live instruction. Um, concerns that a, that a lot of other parents have shared that uh, this is placing placing our students um, in an already challenging world um, with the possibility of becoming even further behind um, those that are just living in communities right by us. Um, in addition, uh, I will echo that I am also very pleased to see the diversity among the new hires. I think that's an important uh, opportunity, and I'd like to think that Rampa has had some role in helping the district to realize the importance of being very um, specific and very intentional in their hiring and their diversity practices. I continue to just remain very disappointed that letters that come from the board, proclamations, all of those things continue to avoid giving any credit to Rampa or um, its 300 plus community members that signed the open letter. I don't understand it. I don't understand what the board's fear is in um, acknowledging Rampa and I sincerely hope that that is something that can change in the future. And I appreciate the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much. 
Jennifer Acevedo? Yes, Jennifer Acevedo. I live at 1122 North Pleasant Street. I have two sons in the school district. One is in high school and one's in middle school. And I just wanted to start with, um, I have some appreciation, some questions and some suggestions. First off, I wanna start off with appreciation for the teachers in our district. They're doing an amazing job with the situation. Um, I work from home right now and I'm getting glimpses of the conversations. And it's clear that they, are, they really care about educating and engaging our kids. Also, I've witnessed the athletic director, <clears throat> excuse me, and the soccer coaches lead our kids during these challenging times and they are doing an excellent job. Now onto some questions I have. The main one being with the middle school and the remote learning plan, it's leaving much to be desired and I know it's early in the process, but I would like to be pointed to some information whether it's data or reports that show what they base their decisions on. Because I'm, I'm curious if there's other schools doing this in the area. Um, all I know is this week it didn't work so well with my middle school student, um, but I'm hoping that it's just early in the process. Also, I was just wondering if there are gonna be any opportunities to rework the schedule before the marking period ends, or if this is the end all be all for this marking period. Um, because that would be appreciated to give some feedback. Um, and I recently read, but I don't know if it's accurate, if the VOS is making our students do testing, how can we expect our Royal Oak Middle Schoolers to test on a subject they aren't even taking or that they haven't taken in months? I'm not sure where the tests fall in the timeline of school, but that's a little bit concerning when they don't have six subjects that they're currently working on. And so we owe it to our kids to provide the best, most engaging remote learning plans as possible. I'm just not sure this three subject schedule is gonna get us where we need to be. Some suggestions for having such an extreme shift in schedule for all of our schools, but especially this middle school with only three days of three subjects, more communication. Um, it might seem like over communication to some, but I'm getting a lot of my information from the PTA Facebook, Facebook groups and I'd be lost without them. So I would just say communicate more than you really think you need to. And I, this is probably true for all school levels. Another suggestion I have is please respond to the demands from the Royal Oak Multicultural Parents Association. They're doing difficult but much needed work for our community and it can't just serve as nice words we wish to live up to. I'm asking this board to do the same difficult work and meet our students and families with their needs. And I'm kind of all over the place today, but my final suggestion I had is the city of Royal Oak recently declared a climate crisis. Then they're taking actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Schools can be an excellent partner in helping the city reach their goals. So I please suggest that you work with the city, the Royal Oak Environmental Advisory Board, and student environmental groups to keep Royal Oak school buildings moving to a cleaner green direction. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Thank you very much. I see Deanna, you were on there for a second and then you disappeared. Deanna, did you want to address the board? She's there now. Perfect. Okay, go ahead, Deanna. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, my name is Deanna Toko. I'm, uh, I live on 6th Street in Royal Oak, and I'm the parent of two children who, who are in the Royal Oak system. My daughter graduated two years ago, and my son is at the high school. Um, and a few things I want to say, one is that I, I do take issue with the representation of how the special ed families are receiving what's happening. 
Um, that has not been my experience or the experience of people I've talked to. Um, my son is at the high school. He is a special ed student. And this week he has one class per day, general ed classes, um, and one of them is gym. Um, he's not getting any of his special ed classes. Um, his teachers are spending their time um, instead of working with them, they're spending their time doing these contingency learning plans, which um, are not really even legal to ask parents to sign on to. Um, the time would be better spent working with the students and then also um, trying to update IEPs because that's not being done either. Um, you know, it's very frustrating to have uh, a young person who needs the education and the, the um, information and is very limited in what he's getting this week as opposed to other kids his age. Um, the other thing I wanna say is uh, in terms of the Rampa group, I'm a new participant to that group um, and so appreciate the work that they're doing. Um, I do have, both of my children are kids of color and they both have had varied experiences in the district um, in terms of uh, how they've been treated, how they've been dealt with, um, both by peers, by teachers, um, by administration. Um, it's, it's necessary, the work that they're doing. And um, when I read the resolution that came out, it seemed very congratulatory to the district and not really addressing the issue. Um, we have to be honest about what the issues are and be willing to be transparent about that and, and say that we haven't always done the best around this and that we need to do better. Um, and there's lots of people willing to work to make that happen. And I appreciate the cultural competency committees and the people working on that. Um, but it's time to take it to the next level. Things need to be uh, put in motion. So with that, um, you know, I'll, I'll close what I'm saying, but I, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, the special ed kids are not getting the services that they need. Um, I appreciate that they're gonna be able to have some face-to-face -face time that's necessary for my son, but I agree with some of the other parents that have said, you know, services are being cut dramatically and we understand it and we're not blaming the teachers, um, but it's, you know, it's very difficult when you're raising a 15-year-old a, a and trying to get him engaged in school um, to be online for one hour a day, if that. And one of those hours is gym. So um, it doesn't seem like a fair and equitable education for him at this point. Um, so with that, I'll close. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you. With that, I think we've completed, we've reached everyone. Paula, do you see anyone else? No, I think we are good. Okay, with that, we'll close public comments and we'll move on to communications. Mrs. Van Heitzma. Yes, Mr. Brinker, um, we've had a few communications since our last board meeting from Amy Altich um, in regards to public education, from Emily Arbrutin, um, Equity Inclusion from um, Orit and Sean Milligan regarding the remote learning. Um, a thank you from the Sust family and some student questions from Claire Rasco. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just want to, uh, again, publicly thank Ms. Avila and her team uh, regarding the audit and, and also extend another uh, thank you that she had, which is that um, the entire district staff uh, following our protocols and our guidelines uh, also leads to a clean audit. And it, it's due to the leadership by Ms. Avila and her team um, to make sure that those policies and practices are adhered to. Uh, and you know, really, we heard some good news tonight about our uh, standing with the state in terms of funding. Um, but our school finance research collaborative that we've spoken of in the past 
uh, is a group that has worked with us and many leaders in education and other groups in the communities um, to fight for fair funding for our students in schools. Um, it is not equitable across all districts and it, it varies um, greatly. Um, and we believe that there is a better funding model. And I uh, would encourage us all to continue to be familiar with the School Finance Research Collaborative and their work and hope that that's uh, continually being shared at the state level with our legislators as well. Uh, regarding our own local funding, you heard tonight also from Ms. Abella regarding the millage information that is fully on our website. You can find it from our homepage on the right-hand column under news. Uh, there's information there regarding the ballot language, uh, where it will uh, exist uh, on the ballot, uh, as well as some other information about voting in the community. Um, so you can see our website for additional information. Uh, tonight, we've had updates on curriculum, special education, technology, athletics. Uh, I wanted to just add to that, that all of this has been a part of our continuity of learning plan that began in the spring. And with a lot of feedback and a lot of work about uh, responding to a crisis situation, uh, we did spend a number of uh, weeks and days this summer preparing for the return to learn plan, which was also successfully committed in August to our Oakland ISD and then in turn to the state on our behalf. Uh, a new provision now for uh, accountability and communicating with the board into the community is a new level, which is an extended learning plan document and timeline where districts will be asked to submit uh, monthly updates to the ISD and then to the state on how we are uh, responding with the COVID crisis in mind and our continuity of learning plans. And so that will be a new addition to the accountability measures uh, that we're following from the state. We're working very closely with our county um, support staff out at Oakland schools, and they are helping us with those templates and protocols. Uh, we do continually review our learning plans that we've put in place, um, and we will continue to do that throughout this school year. Um, as you know, right now, uh, we are staying remote with our learning for most of the students through November 6th with other provisions to bring back small groups uh, and specific students by request over our local high school. Uh, and we will continue to work on those plans um, following this first week and for several weeks of school. Um, I'd also like to give an update on the nurses from the Oakland County Health Department. I've spoken before that our county had a uh, initiative uh, that was brought to them uh, in collaboration with Oakland Schools and the uh, Oakland County um, staff to give us, provide nurses to all of the public schools in Oakland County. We in Royal Oak have now met two of our nurses. Um, those are the two that will work with us throughout this first semester. I believe they're officially uh, collaborating and consulting with us through December. Uh, we have met all of them, including their supervisor from Oakland County Health Department. And this week and next, they are conducting building uh, tours and visits to meet our staff and to look at the protocols and practices that we have in place. I'm also uh, encouraged that as part of their response to COVID, uh, these nurses are also trained and can assist us with other health issues regarding our students that receive treatments or medications at school or have other learning um, needs that need to be met through a health plan. And those nurses are also available to us um, to help us with those um, health plans that our students have. Um, tomorrow, um, Jane Flaherty Graham will meet with another group. They're going to tour two more of our schools and meet our staff uh, and ask questions. Uh, they come prepared with a checklist to ensure that our district is protected. Uh, our buildings are using the correct safety measures that our students are protected and our buildings are ready. Um, and also that, um, you know, when we do have a, a return for students, it is the safest plan possible. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the nursing uh, initiative and, and hopeful that they'll um, be a great part of our team to collaborate with as we, we move forward, as Mr. Wachowski also said. I believe that's it. We also um, have an item on the agenda tonight that um, Ms. Bella spoke about, which is the reinstatement of a full budget for the Schedule B in clubs. Um, we heard a number earlier about how many students participate in athletics. There are literally thousands of students, K-12 across our district, that participate in clubs and other uh, activities. And those extracurricular activities are also very important to our students um, while they're learning uh, in the classroom. Um, with an optimistic budget uh, picture in front of us, um, at least for the 2021 school year, 
Uh, we believe that an initial cut of $100,000 that was made in a, in a hopes to balance a budget is something that we can afford back in our budget because I think the impact, the positive impact on our students to bring those clubs back is essential. So that um, is on your agenda tonight uh, for item 9.9. Thank you. Any questions for Mrs. Fitzpatrick? I see none. Thank you very much. With that, we will go to the consent agenda. Currently, the consent agenda consists of item 8.1 personnel changes, 8.2 payment of expenses, 8.3 minutes. Are there any additions or subtractions to the consent agenda? I guess I would propose that we add 9.2, the first reading of revised, replaced, and or recommended policies and guidelines. 9.3, the OCSBA bylaws. 9.4, the RAMC student device purchasing. 9.5, the acceptance of audit. 9.6, the ROMS boiler replacement contract award. 9.7, the quality environmental contract change award. And 9.8, the restore schedule be in clubs to 2019 and 2020 levels. And again, all of the financial ones or the facility ones were fully discussed in facilities and finance last Thursday. Any objections to adding those to the consent agenda? You, include, you included all but 9.1? Is that correct? correct. Okay. So the consent agenda consists of 8.1 personnel changes, 8.2 payment of expenses, 8.3 minutes, 9.2 first reading of revised policies, 9.3 OCSBA bylaws, 9.4 REMC student device purchasing, 9.5 acceptance of audit, 9.6 the ROMS boiler replacement, 9.7 quality environmental contract changes, and 9.8 restore schedule B in clubs to 1920 levels. With that, the consent agenda is passed. Can I get a, so we'll move on to 9.1 diversity, equity, and inclusion resolution. Can I get a resolution, please? Mrs. Van Heitzma. Thank you, Mr. Brinker. Whereas the Royal Oak Schools Board of Education values every student, family, and staff member and is committed to creating a diverse, equitable, and inclusive learning environment for all students, and whereas the board and district remain committed to providing all students with a high quality education that promotes diversity and inclusion, prioritizes equity and fairness, and helps them, helps them succeed in an increasingly competitive global world. And whereas there is a long history of racism, discrimination, and segregation within our country, which has, ad, has adversely impacted educational and economic outcomes for many racial groups. And whereas over the past four years, the board and district have taken significant steps toward achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion district-wide. And whereas the district formed the Cultural Competence Engagement Committee comprised of students, parents, and community members to address issues related to race, religion, sexual orientation, special needs, language, and poverty, and whereas the Cultural Competence Engagement Committee commits to addressing these issues as they impact the curriculum, professional development, hiring practices, and supporting students. And whereas the board and district believe a fair and individualized approach to student behavior concerns is the best way to keep our students and classrooms safe. And whereas the district added two full-time social workers, school social workers trained to provide families and students with specialized social and emotional support. And whereas the district also retains a full-time restorative practice coach who trains staff to provide students with skills to resolve conflicts peacefully. And whereas the district will continue tracking its progress in responding to student behaviors and its disciplinary practices, adjusting as needed and addressing any inequities. And whereas the district provides staff with professional development and cultural, culturally responsive teaching, implicit bias and social justice. And whereas this training will persist in the 2020-2021 school year and beyond, including for all newly hired staff. 
And whereas the district has committed providing diverse and culturally responsive core texts in our elementary, middle school, and high school English language arts classes. And whereas the district will accelerate a more inclusive curriculum this school year with an emphasis on social studies. And whereas the district's work on diversity, equity, and inclusion is far from done. Therefore, be it resolved, the Royal Oaks Schools Board of Education is committed to building on the district's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives with input from students, families, staff, community members, and other stakeholders in the 2020-2021 school year and beyond. Jeff, you were muted. You're muted, Jim. Sorry about that. Can I get a second, please? Ms. An Mrs. Anderson, thank you very much. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Van Heitsma. Um, yes, I would just like to further add um, is, you know, the work we've been doing, um, I'm very grateful to this, the, the effort put forth by the district, by the staff, by the community. Um, you know, I think we all recognize that, you know, this is an issue that's not just within our schools, it's within the city, it's within the country. Um, and, you know, to continue the work is, is imperative um, and the time is now. And so I think this resolution is, is important. Thank you. Thank you. Any other further comments? I see none. Can I get a roll call, please? Um, Mrs. Anderson. I vote yes. Mr. Briggs. Yes. Mr. Brinker. Yes. Mrs. Beer. I vote yes. Mr. Cardamon. Yes. Mrs. Sykes. Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you very much. Motion passes. With that, we will move on to item number 10, the public comment. Again, same rules as previously. Would anyone like to address the board? Okay, I see no hands raised. Paula, do you see anything? I do not. I do not. With that, we'll close the second public comment. We'll move on to item number 11, board comments and liaison reports. Are there any board comments or liaison reports? Mrs. Anderson. I just wanted to mention that I believe we have a special meeting coming up September 24th, and I wonder if we could hear a little bit more about that. Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Certainly, um, there's been a lot of discussion about the response to student behaviors in the discipline data uh, on 924, as was indicated in a, a previous uh, letter to the community by the board. That is the date for a special board meeting where we will uh, review the district's discipline data and other responses um, to student behaviors uh, at, at that special public meeting. Uh, in addition, uh, we will bring any recommendations to you about how to um, address any disparity or uh, uh, issues that we may have in, in responding to student uh, discipline. Uh, we'll take a close look at ourselves and our practices and, and talk about how to address uh, any of the issues that we uh, might have uh, with that close look at the data. Um, so that's on 924 uh, as a special meeting and that meeting will also be virtual and will be posted for the community's participation. Any other questions? Any other liaison reports? Mrs. Van Heitsma. Um, yes, as school is back, our PTAs are gearing up again as well. Um, so I know some of them have already begun meeting. Um, so um, I'm excited to at least meet with them virtually this year, right now. So that's a good lead into one of my comments is that with the schools starting back up, we are going to keep the PTA assignments the same, 
especially since we have four contested board seats in November, which means there will be potentially four changes coming up in January. So instead of changing in September and then changing again in um, January, PTA and committee assignments will stay the same until January. So if there's any questions, let me know. But again, we'd be in the same schools as we were. And again, we all have one school that we're assigned to. We'll continue forward. Um, last year at this time, we talked about changing the superintendent evaluation tool. So again, as a board, we have one evaluation that we do as a board that happens in December. So we have a, revi a potential revised tool that we received from the legal team to use. Um, staff relations looked at it. I'll send it out to the entire board and we'll talk about it in October if we want to use this tool. So from my point of view, it seems to be more user friendly than the tool we've used for the last 10 years. It's being used by a number of other districts in both Oakland and Macomb County. And it seems very appropriate for what we're going to do or of what how the review we have. And again, it takes away that calculation piece, which I think is very, very important. Uh, we'll still have to add the student achievement data to it, which is necessary according to state law. But after I forward it to this week, um, if you have any questions or concerns, let us know, let me know, and we'll discuss them. But in October, should we decide we want to use this tool, we'll need to set up some training with the team that created it so that we are, are using it appropriately. That training is estimated to take about an hour, hour 10. So in October, we'll talk about whether we want it in mid-October, early November for the December review. And we'll ask Paula to set up some a date for it at that time, but you'll see that coming later. Um, with that, I the other comment I had, if we didn't talk about it, was the new hire video. I love that new hire video. It is posted on the website. Um, I thought it was a great thing. I thought it was very positive. Um, I don't know if I would have taken up kayaking as a COVID activity, but God bless her. So any other liaison comments? Mrs. Van Heitsma. Um, I did forget to mention on the consent agenda, the policy that um, was on there. Um, we had a policy committee meeting, so that was um, discussed at some pretty great length with, with the, uh, the attendees for that. Um, so just in case anybody has any questions, there was a lot of conversation in regards to that policy. And again, the policy committee is an open meeting, so public can attend and invite it. But again, that is where the details are worked out into the policies. Any other comments for the board from the board? I see none. With Mr. Breaker? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. That's okay. I just want to add, um, this is the, the first review of that policy change. It will appear again in October. Um, this policy specifically is in uh, response to changes in the federal law regarding Title IX. Uh, so there's a, a, a number of documents for us to take a look through and also understand the changes in policy, but it, it is the first reading and it will appear again in October. Just Thank you very much. Mr. Cardamone. I was going to say, I'm not sure if we mentioned this earlier. Is there not a CCEC general meeting on the 29th that came out today? Just to remind all the listeners about that. Yes, we, we have the next CCEC meeting on the 29th at 630. It's the virtual meeting. This is Anderson. I believe that was mentioned in the superintendent's report, but I did want to also say that we don't really have three board members um, all in the same room with the same background um, and the same furniture behind them, which is what it looks like right now. Uh, it's all these virtual backgrounds. There so. you go. Okay, any final comments? I see none. We'll move on to number 12. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Have a safe evening.